Good morning, dear colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Thank you for being here. We're getting started in the morning session of this LIPE Committee inquiry on the electronic mass surveillance on EU citizens. First of all, let me please adopt the agenda. I would like to remind you that, as indicated in the second hearing, September the 12th, today we will be conducting the third hearing of this LIBE inquiry on the mass surveillance on EU citizens. We've had so far feedback and information, but today's hearing especially intense. We're going to be having five different sessions. First of all, our colleague, Mr. Moraes, and I'm looking for him. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> be welcome, Claude. Uh, uh, maybe he, he, he would like to comment on today's agenda, a special organization. Would you? Would you, Claude, make some comment? Yeah, just some, uh, thank you, Chairman. Just a couple of um, uh, notes. Um, colleagues wanted me to, as rapporteur, just to keep them informed about invitations that um, I was responsible for as rapporteur to keep them informed as we go through the inquiry. Um, by the way, I'm sitting here because we're, the Secretariat is trying some other arrangements of where the shadows and the rapporteur is sitting, so just bear with us as we uh, do that. Um, I wanted to just keep members aware of who we're inviting and who has accepted invitations to the inquiry. Um, and the current state of affairs is that um, an invitation was sent to Robert Wood as the first Secretary and Acting Ambassador to the United States Mission uh, to the EU, um, but we received no confirmation that he would attend today's inquiry meeting. Um, to update colleagues on other invitations that were sent to the US Administration, um, uh, we um, also invited uh, the Dutch Ministers Ivo Oppelsten, um, the Minister of Security and Justice, and Ronald Plasterk, Minister of the Interior um, and Kingdom Relations to our session today, uh, given that the SWIFT servers are based in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, both ministers declined this invitation to speak in this public hearing, uh, preferring instead to wait for the outcome of the ongoing consultations uh, between Commissioner Malmström and Secretary Cohen, uh, which puts uh, um, more importance on our first session this morning. Um, I'll continue to update on any contact we have with both the U.S. Administration and any uh, representation by member state governments and their willingness to come before the public inquiry. So as we go through the inquiry, I'll ensure that um, I'm as transparent as possible about who accepts and declines our invitations as we go along. Thank you, Claude. Thank you. Claude, as I said, if no objections with the agenda, as foreseen, it is adopted. And then we move on to the first of the five sessions that are announced. This is going to be having place for the next hour. And uh, the first point here is uh, the uh, revelations we've had that uh, allegedly, according to the recent news report, there has been secret NSA tapping into personal financial data from SWIFT database. The EU-US TFTP agreement, as you remind, from 2010 onwards, contains detailed provisions allowing the transfer of SWIFT data to the US authorities for the fight against terrorism or terrorist financing. Europol has been given the task to verify whether the request of U.S. authorities comply with the terms of the agreement or not. The condition was, of course, one of the main grounds for the European Parliament to approve the agreement 
in the first place. So we have Commissioner Malmstrom, who wrote on September the 12th to U.S. Under Secretary Cohen, asking clarification. There has been a reply September the 18th. The issue is to be debated October the 8th. But today, anyhow, we are so pleased to welcome again before the Libre Committee our Commissioner Malmstrom. And then we will be having Europol Director, Mr. Wainwright, and Mrs. Pitre from SWIFT. Coffee, coffee, please. Mrs. Pitre from SWIFT to inform this inquiry about the important issue at stake. Then we will be having I have some more. Belgian Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. De Boykeler, if I'm pronouncing it right, who is in the room. And then the uh, British uh, Government Communications Headquarters uh, 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 will be debated. Uh, maybe also by the NSA, National Security Agency, into the Belga Common Systems. We'll be debriefed. So let's get started with the uh, statement by our Commissioner Cecilia Malmström. I will give the floor to our Commissioner for a brief statement concerning the NSA tapping into SWIFT data bank and the repercussions on the TFTP agreement. Then there will be questions and answers, but I am announcing, as we have a, an intense agenda with five sessions, I suggest all the members willing to, to contribute into the discussion to refrain to uh, two minutes uh, round of uh, questions and answers to the commissioner, so that we may be having further time for the other guests. So let's get started with the Commissioner. Cecilia Malmström, you have the floor. Thank you very much, President. Good morning, honorable members, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I am here to, to share with you uh, some, some views on the press allegation about possible access of the U.S. National Security Agency into the data exchanged through the EU-U.S. TFTP agreement. And I will concentrate on this with your agreement, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I, I know other aspects of um, uh, counterterrorism cooperation will be addressed at a later stage today. I am, as you are, of course, very concerned about these allegations circulated in the press. As you know, the EU TFTP agreement with the United States was negotiated precisely to avoid the personal data of EU citizens are exposed without legal guarantees and safeguards. The agreement puts in place the legal framework ensuring that the data necessary for combating terrorism that we share with the US are handled in an appropriate manner with full respect of data protection rights. And this agreement also regulates in an extensive way any transfer of SWIFT data from the SWIFT database to, from in the EU to the US authorities. And I have in the past informed you about how the system is set up, the guarantees and the safeguard in the joint reviews for 2011 and 2012. And my services are currently preparing yet another report on the value of TFTP. But in light of recent developments, I have put it on hold. The 4th of July this year, after the initial media reports about the existence of the U.S. surveillance program, I sent immediately a letter to my U.S. counterparts to request their full cooperation in bringing clarity on these programs and their potential implications for the TFTP and PNR agreements. In parallel, the work of the EU-U.S. Uh, working group on data protection was set up to establish the facts on the alleged access and processing of personal data of EU citizens by the, EU and that, uh, by the US and that keeps on working, of course. The 11th of September, I called Under Secretary David Cohen. He's at the Treasury Department and I told him that I wait for substantial information how uh, and what and uh, when on all these uh, allegations. The next day I also sent him a letter in which I requested opening of consultations under Article 19 of the agreement. And this is, as you know, a formal step to be taken in case of disputes between the parties 
to the TFTP agreement. And during these consultations, I will be seeking exhaustive explanation, comprehensive information and explanations in order to measure to which extent the implementation of the agreement might have been impacted. And in reply to my letter, the US authorities have provided some written explanations, and I have sent this letter uh, to you for information. Uh, this letter raises a number of questions that need to be pursued, pursued under the Article 19 consultation. And I'm not satisfied with what we have gotten so far. Whilst from the US reaction last week we have some understanding of the situation, we need more detailed information in order to credibly access reality and to be in a position to judge whether the obligations of the US side under the agreement have been breached. Proceeding with the consultations is now top of my agenda for myself and for my services. We are going to meet uh, in personal with our US counterparts very soon to discuss all pertinent questions. And I would very much uh, like you to give me questions to put to the American counterparts uh, as well so I can say that, that we speak from, from, from all the institutions. So I, I welcome suggestions for precise uh, questions. A decision to uh, either maintain the agreement or to consider proposing its suspension is, of course, a very serious matter. And you will certainly understand that whilst media reports can trigger formal consultations, as they have now, a decision to propose a suspension requires, according to the agreement, objective and comprehensive assessment and consultations. Uh, we need more information, we need more clarity, and I expect to get them very soon. And I will make sure that you are fully informed about the future developments and that any recommendations with regards to uh, the future of TFTP agreement will, of course, be discussed with you as well. I stop here, Mr. Chairman, in order to be able to answer as many questions as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. We thank you. We thank you, Commissioner Mastom. Tiesiai kalbėjote apie asmę. Taip ir man atrodo, dabar galėtume jau pateikti klausimus. Pirmas apranešiai, po to šešėliniai ir po to visi kiti nariai. Bet kadangi sąrašas gana ilgas, o laiko turime nedaug. Ik tai iki pusės vienuolikos turime laiko. Taigi, prašom laikytis duotą laiko, kitaip, kaip visada, pritūksnum laiko. Pirmasis, ačiū už suteiktą žūdį nariams, to mums reikėjo. Na, pirmiausia, klausimai, kurios reikėtų iškelti tie klausimai į kuriuos jau buvo iš dalies atsakyta arba iš viso nebuvo atsakyta, jei reikėtų juos pakartauti, dar ką tai užduoti. Na, pirmiausia, kalbame apie duomenis ateinančios iš išdo. Buvo atskleisti duomenis. Ar jums žinoma, iš kur atsigavo šitos reikalingos duomenės? Ar visada iš tikrųjų laikomas yra numatytų procedūrų? Na, dar vėl reikėtų kalbėti apie svoj centrus jungtinėse valstijose. Jau jūs minėjote skirtorio kolino. Mums buvo pateikta jokios informacijos apie tai. Taigi, reikėtų, kad taip pat kitos visos organizacijos užsimančios tokių duomenų sakymų aš tikrųjų laikytų su procedūru. Jeigu būtų pamatyta kas nors kokia nors atveja, kada nesilaikoma, reikėtų iš kartų atkreipti dėmesį. Na, pirmiausia, svarbu, kad nepriklausome atstovai, iš tikrųjų, žiūrėtų, kokie duomenės pateikiami išsvirt, ir tiesiog neišleisti iš akių finansavimo reikalų. Mums reikia užtikrinti, kad iš tikrųjų dirbtų visiškai nepriklausami žmonės, kurie priežiūrėtų, kaip laikomas jūsų susitarimą. 
yra aiškiai sako, kad taisyklis, kurios apsaugo bilyčio teisės, duomenų apsaugos teisės, jas, jeigu reikia tiesiog galima peržiūrėti, pavyzdžiui, gali būti išarinis įbėjį ir taip pat parlamentas galėtų čia savo vaidmenį suvaidinti. Taigi reikėtų kalbėti apie kaip gyvenimas 12 straipsnis, nes man būtų tiesiog įdomu sužinoti, kiek kartų nepriklausomas pareigūnas iš tikrųjų yra sustabdęs vaidmenų pateikimą. Keturi metai praėjo atsitarimu ir parlamentas buvo skyręs tam tikrą laiką naujomis sakomybėm prisimti. Taigi, kaip ir laikomas į reikimų standartų Kaip jums atrodo, jūs sutinkate, kad reikėtų peržiūrėti, kad būtų suteikta domino apsaugo Europos Sąjungos piliečiams tokie, kokie jis turėtų būti. Na, ir jau pradėtos konsultacijos. Dabar lygtai yra, toks laikas, kada man dabar sutabdyti šito sustarimo galiojimą. Dabar tokia padaitis. Dabar norėčiau išgirsti, ką mūsų pranešės. Ačiū, ponė Nostrum, už tai, kad dalyvaujate. Klausimas, kurį uždavėte dėl NSA. Jau girdėjau, kad norėjote pradėti konsultacijas dėl 19 TFTP straipsnių. Turėčiau užduoti klausimą susijusi su TFTP susidarimu 2011 ar tai 10 rūkpjūtį susitarta buvo, kad komisija report of process on the development of the equivalent system with regard to Article 11 of the agreement. Can we expect maybe in the next time to see such proposals? Um, and according to going into the agreement, according to Article 4 uh, of the agreement, <clears throat> data which is requested shall be tailored as narrowly as possible. Um, the Commission report on the implementation actually states uh, that uh, the U.S. Department will never be uh, or have access to the largest number of the data requested. Um, the other question is why then do they keep those data? Um, according to Article 16, there shall be the right to seek the rectification for every data subject concerning uh, the data, um, but uh, also there on the report of the implementation, it states that the TFTP <coughs> agreement rectification of data in the strict sense was technically not feasible. I think this uh, should also cause for worries. Also, uh, going further in the agreement, Article 6 states that the data um, shall be deleted no later than five years from receipt. Um, we know that the data received between July 2007, um, <clears throat> between 2007 and 2000, um, July 2007 and October 2007 was not deleted <clears throat> before the 21st of October 2012. So I think another question which has to be raised. Concerning Article 12, I agree with the question put forward by, by my colleague Claude Moraz. And um, just to close and not to extend the time, I want to <coughs> agree and support Claude Moraz in the question of the suspension um, because Parliament, of course, I cannot speak for Parliament, um, but personally, I would be in favor um, to have this minimum as an option. Uh, to discuss suspension of the agreement with the United States um, and to make it also clear to the United States that the alleged accusations, in case there is the doubt that they might be true, actually cannot lead to anything else but suspending the agreement. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now let's, let's have some 
shadows and then back to our commissioner and then we will be opening some additional room for maneuvering with questions and answers from the rest of the members. We get started by the EPP shadow, Mr. Foss, Herr Foss. So, genau. Also, um es... Axel Foss. Thank you, Chairman. Well, to keep things uh, short and sweet, I've got the same questions really as Alexander Alfaro and Claude Mores. Um I think it's worth uh, repeating. Do you have anything extra um, over and above what's been reported in the newspapers? One is told that um, with the NSA there is a, uh, there's a manual regarding SWIFT, but we don't really know whether they've, these things which can be done have actually been done. And uh, secondly, can you help us um, with the NSA? If the NSA has been taking data from SWIFT, um, was that the case before or after the TFTP agreement? Was there a cut-off point um, when there wasn't an agreement with the, uh, over the, N the TFTP and the NSA started and stopped various activities uh, after a cut-off point. Is that the case? Just help us with the timing of that. I hope that we are all um, singing from the same um, hymn sheet. Of course, we want to keep a, a watchful eye on the uh, financing of terrorism. Someone has to do that. Either we do that or the Americans do that. I understand that so far we have not technically been able to do that, and consequently the U.S. Um, is best placed to do that. My own um, evaluation is that you've got two things here. You've got uh, proceeding on a legal basis. We've got the agreement with SWIFT, or rather with the U.S. over the terrorism program. And there we're saying that uh, th these are the rules and that's the basis of our legality. Or there's a second possibility, which is unlawful. Now, my own evaluation is that at this point, we cannot simply withdraw and say uh, we want to proceed in, in a on a legal basis and leave the unlawful side just developing by itself. We have got to make sure that everything is under control um, and nothing is simply left to, to fester, as it were. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. My questions will be of a slightly more political nature. First of all, I'm very pleased uh, with the very uh, um, uh, strong attitude taken by the European Commissioner uh, to the Americans. I'm pleased to hear her say that the, the answers are um, not satisfactory. Um, if we look at the, uh, the TFTP agreement uh, in a wider perspective, it has been controversial from the very start. The legal base is controversial to say the very least. Um, we, at least my group, gave its uh, consent to the agreement on the understanding that the Commission would put forward proposals for a system for the extraction of data, which we do not have to date. So for me, my, the, the, the one consideration I had to support the agreement uh, does no longer exist. Thirdly, there have been concerns uh, over the implementation. Uh, critical reports have been classified. Um, so. You know, the whole thing is controversial. Now we hear allegations that the NSA may have uh, been tapping into the uh, SWIFT server directly and using the data for purposes uh, way beyond counterterrorism. Now, we have no evidence that they have actually been doing this, but they don't deny it either. They actually say, basically, in the letter, they say, no, no, we think this is great. We think we have a right to do this, and we reserve the right to do this. So in a way, it's irrelevant whether they have used the opportunity so far, because they will continue to, to, to reserve that right in the future. So for me, Chair, the agreement is effectively dead. It has been unilaterally declared dead. Um, because if the, the, the Americans consider they don't need the agreement to tap into the, uh, to the data and that they can use the data for any purpose they deem fit, the agreement is null and void. It has no meaning. 
uh, anymore. Because they may well say in their, in their letter that they respect the TFTP agreement. I'm not really sure what that means. They may respect it at the front door, but they certainly don't respect it at the back door. So I would like to ask the Commission uh, if they consider to propose a suspension, or, or rather, and I agree with my colleague Alvaro, a, a termination because that would be, you know, that's the, the actual situation. And I would like to conclude on saying, um, you know, the Parliament under the Lisbon Treaty has the, 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 the power to conclude or rather to, to approve international agreements. But it's basically like signing a blank check because once we've approved an agreement, there is nothing we can do anymore. So obviously this will be a test case for the European Parliament. If we're not happy with the way our opinion is taken into account, well, I will certainly be extremely reluctant to approve any future uh, international agreements. So this is also a political issue within the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Herr Albrecht. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I don't want to repeat what has been said. I think that has been a very important exchange, and it is. And I would like to add the question that if you are not considering a termination or suspension of the agreement right now, are you therefore accepting that there is a possible breach to the TFTP agreement? And uh, the other question which I would like to pose is, are you bringing forward infringement procedures against member states not fulfilling the cybercrime rules which we just passed with regard to infringements to information systems by the NSA? Or do you consider any action with regard to the protection of EU information systems security breached by the NSA or other intelligence services like the GCHQ in the UK, which would be in your competence, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Frau Ernst. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair. First of all, um, I have a question, Mrs. Uh, Malmström. At any point, has there been any indication that the U.S. authorities have confessed to any um, thing being slightly untoward? Have they accepted or acknowledged the fact that there is any difficulty uh, with our agreements in? or any suggestion of um, them fessing up to anything being wrong. And then secondly, do you receive documents? How do you um, learn about the ongoing development? Do you have any privileged pathways of information? Do you have anything to go on, any document, documentary um, evidence? which would uh, suggest that uh, data has been passed on in any um, improper way or inappropriate way. And then uh, finally, how is the SWIFT data protected? Um, in other words, what kind of software, what programs are, are used uh, in order to provide um, a firewall, as it were, for, for SWIFT? Um, is there any inspection or oversight of the security procedures uh, to protect SWIFT. I'd be very interested on the, actually on the protocol for the transmission of uh, SWIFT data. Um, it seems to me that um, the SWIFT agreement is also coming under scrutiny. Um, it could well be that there's no need for us to have a uh, uh, a swift agreement at all, if it's being completely circumvented. We have been proceeding with uh, SWIFT on a completely um, out outdated or outmoded uh, basis. And if that is the case, then what would be what's necessary? If we were to go for suspension of the SWIFT agreement, um, then, or even if it were to be set aside on a, a temporary basis, 
would this lead to any practical problems or is it something which would be feasible at all? Thank you very much. In, in questioning seriously the uh, continuity of the TEFTP and uh, resorting to the uh, ways and means that the European Parliament has to first ask for the suspension or even the denunciation of the of the uh, of the of the treaty itself so it's it's pretty serious matter I'm, I'm, I'm sure you may provide some some first reaction and insight according to the to the uh, exchange that you've had with the US authorities so far before we proceed to the rest of the members willing to make questions Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. Uh, yes, of course, it's an extremely serious matter. That, that's why, why we are, are here today, and I'm grateful to have this first exchange of you. I'm sure there will be, be, be many following. Uh, remembering the, the history of this, we negotiated an agreement with the Americans in order to cooperate, to fight, and to, fin to, to track the financing of terrorism. Uh, now, as, as uh, Sophie Interveld said, this was a controversial agreement, uh, but the Parliament uh, accepted this with a very strong uh, majority. Now, in that agreement, we had very clear safeguards on the purpose, on the, the, uh, who had access, on the, the data protection, on how it would be used, etc. And we found that sufficiently uh, protected in order to, to agree on this agreement. We have uh, made two reviews that, that have been discussed with you, showing, no, showing some, some initial um, challenges that continuously need to be improved, but no breach of the agreement and no major problem. We also have two overseers uh, there who work in order to, to make sure that, that, that there is a constant uh, review and, and overseeing. And we are finalizing a report just now, uh, as was demanded by you, on the, the, um, the added value of the whole agreement. That report is basically uh, done, but of course with the current uh, debate we put it a little bit uh, on hold because this uh, plays into it as well. Now, there has been very severe allegations in the press, very severe. We don't know whether they are true, but they are serious enough to raise very important questions to the Americans. You have done that, the Commission have done that immediately when we found out, via telephone and via letters. And we have made that very clear that if those allegations are true, they constitute a breach of the agreement and a breach of the agreement can certainly lead to a suspension. That's why we have, according to the agreement, because any suspension will have to be preceded by a consultation. We have asked for consultations to begin. Those consultations will begin very, very shortly. We have had an exchange of letters. I have given you the letter I received. I don't think it answers the questions. Uh, I have received no other um, oral or written material after that. Like you, I still have a lot of questions after that letter, and I will certainly be asking the questions you have raised, the questions that are raised by media, that they have of course, we'll have to go through one by one to say, is it true, is it not true, can you explain, can you clarify? And a lot of other questions uh, as well. And only when all that is on the table and we will have a discussion, can we judge whether there has been a breach of the agreement or not. We cannot uh, proceed in another way. This is an international agreement with steps uh, to, to be followed. Should we consider that there has been a breach of the agreement, the Commission will then uh, discuss that internally in the college, and if we decide uh, to, to, to present a suspension, this is something that will be decided by a qualified majority by the council. But we're not there yet. We have many steps to take before, many answers uh, to receive, and I will make sure that you are uh, fully updated uh, on, on all the steps uh, so far. So the questions that you have raised, I cannot answer them because I don't know the answers. We will certainly look at them. Just to say to, to Mr. Alvaro, yes, that, that report on the possibilities of, of having an extraction of data on European soil or some other comment, it, it is there also in the light of what has happened. Uh, we have put it on hold a little bit. It is basically... Uh, done, so it will be reported, but we thought it was best to get all this clarity before we, we make any uh, suggestions to go in, in one or, or the other uh, direction. So, so um, Chairman, I realize that, that members are not satisfied with my answers, but, but I have answered everything I know and everything I can for the moment, but I will, of course, be willing to, to come and report regularly. Again, we thank you for your openness and cooperation, and we proceed to the rest of the members.
Uh, we have a, we, uh, a, a, a list. I insist it's not short, so please mind the timing because we still have to go through uh, Mr. de Bocquelier uh, from Belgacom and then Mr. Wainwright will be following as director of Europol. So please refrain to two minutes each. We get started by Herr Pirker. Thank you, Herr Vorsitzende. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one um, prefatory remark. It must be clear that the EU alone is not capable of building proper anti-terrorism defences. We need cooperation. It's only right for us to have agreements with partners such as the US so that we can exchange information for those purposes of um, countering terrorism, preventing terrorism. Secondly, it is now clear that we are not um, capable to produce, uh, to create genuinely secure uh, locations. Um, of course, it, data is important for um, EU PC, in other words, for uh, the location and siting of, of business. And my question is, does the Commission think it's necessary to build its own anti-espionage uh, centre so that we can protect EU um, LPC, uh, PLC rather, so that we can protect um, our information assets, which is of such importance for industry um, in Europe. I know that uh, there has been talk about coordination in counter-espionage, but I don't think anything much has uh, transpired. And is the Commission giving thought to building up a special uh, u unit, as it were? Now, secondly, um, swift information being accessed. Do you have any hard evidence that after that happened, that has happened after July 2010, or has the was swift information access before then, and used by other services? Um, because, Commissioner, you say that for the time being we have uh, certain suspicions and hunches, but is there anything more uh, palpable, more tangible? I think that uh, before we can really have a proper discussion, uh, we need to be in, in possession of all the relevant information so we can contemplate consequences. Uh, but I think we ought not to be uh, threatening uh, retaliation of some kind and then having to um, uh, retract, as it were. Uh, we need to be on very f solid ground, very firm ground, uh, before we start to think of next steps. Um, and I'm just asking, do you have clarity about the information which we, we now have. Dutford. Find the timing. Uh, yes, right. Okay. Um, Commissioner, uh, thank you very much for your um, remarks. Uh, can I just clarify, um, and I, I apologise if I've not entirely understood what you're saying. The reply from Mr Cohen at the Department of the Treasury says... The US government is using the TFTP to obtain swift data that we do not obtain from other sources. In other words, they do not regard the TFTP as an exclusive framework for accessing swift data. They regard it as almost a subsidiary uh, conduit. Does that in itself, in your view, uh, represent a breach of the TFTP agreement? Do you regard the TFTP agreement as the only legal basis for access to SWIFT data. Uh, I'm sorry if this is, is sounding sort of a bit basic, but I'm trying to, to, to clarify it, because you've, you said in your remarks the allegations, if true, would be a breach of the agreement. Does that mean that, um, because under Article 1 of the agreement, the data provided to the US Treasury, and then, as I understand it, transmitted onwards to law enforcement, public security or counter-terrorism authorities. If the Department of the Treasury is giving the data to the NSA, is that within the agreement or not? I I'm always unsure what we mean in EU law by public security, law enforcement or counter-terrorism authorities. Does that cover intelligence agencies, <laughs> given the fact that EU law does not uh, apply to intelligence agencies? Is that the gap? So, if the NSA is getting this data from the Treasury, is that okay? If they're getting the data out with the framework of the TFTP, 
Is that not okay? Is that the divide? Is that the contrast? If NSA is getting it from the Treasury, is that within the agreement or not? I I'm just trying to understand. Thank you. Senora Romero. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mrs. Malmstrom, uh, since you said in your comments that you were not happy with the uh, explanations uh, given by Mr. Cohen, uh, what explanations are you expecting from the U.S.? Then we'd like to know what sort of explanations are you expecting them to provide you with uh, uh, so that you're satisfied by the development of this uh, uh, agreement? Uh, this has been controversial from the outset. Uh, it's, it's not uh, just a question of uh, the U.S. doing this to EU citizens, but uh, the citizens of the world. What sort of mechanisms do we have to uh, stop this uh, uh, intimidating uh, tactic that new technologies are producing. You said at one point that you were interested in having a, a dialogue or, or some sort of conversation with uh, SWIFT. Do we know whether SWIFT is also obliged to provide uh, data to EU governments? Is this happening? Because what's happening with the U.S. is that the SWIFT company is obliged to provide the data is SWIFT obliged to provide data to European countries as well? Uh, that would be an important point to know, to see where, where we are. Uh, because uh, all of us uh, are uh, in a, a situation uh, of being without any sort of defense against this. This seems to be the new world we're working in. So the question is, what sort of mechanism does Europe have to counter this? Because if, uh, I mean, the fact that Europol is the supervisor has never been a convincing argument. Uh, we've never had explanation of this. And the European data supervisor, uh, although uh, Claude has said that we have to have an independent uh, person, uh, well, we still don't have a name or face. Uh, we have no mechanism. And what's even worse, uh, the uh, international fight against uh, terrorism financing uh, for which we have uh, directives, no one talks about this because now we're only talking about the agreement with the U.S. But uh, f uh, terrorism financing is much more serious than just this agreement with the U.S. Thank you, Mr. Diaz de Mera. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Just one idea, but before that, uh, I wanted to say that I entirely agree with what uh, Axel Bos and Hubert Picker has said. Nonetheless, I think that given that we're facing a very controversial and complicated situation, and to try and maintain the substantial point, which is security, that the official journal of 13th of January 2003 has a possibility which the Commission could use I agree with what Commissioner Malmstrom said about the application and the procedure and the path that we have to follow, but, Madam, to me, it seems that in the agreement itself there are possibilities that haven't yet been explored which could be used. For example, there are four American laws which uh, do open the door to uh, legal inquiry if uh, one party uh, does not fulfill the agreement. If I refer to three, the general inspector for 78, uh, the administrative procedure from 46, and uh, finally, more importantly, the abuse and uh, computer abuse and fraud law. Bearing in mind that uh, the independence and the strength of the, Euro the U.S. courts, uh, according to what's in the uh, agreement itself, we could actually start up a court case against them. That's it. Thank you. Frau Sippel. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich will noch Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Once again, can I point out that there is still a lack of clarity with regard to the SWIFT agreement. Um, and this predated 
the NSA scandal, and those questions, those doubts, have been not been dispelled. With regard to did the NSA have access to SWIFT data, um, we've been told that there is a document which suggests that may be the case. But if a secret service can do something, then usually they do sooner or later. And the question then is who has oversight over whether or um, to what extent that kind of access has taken place. And then what happens with data, um, which it turns out has not been used for countering terrorism at all. I must say that there are still questions surrounding these procedures. That my um, hunch is that it's not just the intelligence community in the US which is operating in a grey zone, a grey area. I think that there are other um, intelligence communities which may be doing exactly the same. Colleagues have said we need something hard and fast before we decide to put the agreement on ice. Uh, but I think that's risible, that's ridiculous. I think that uh, we should be com um, tearing it up. It's not just a question of putting it into the deep freeze for the time being. I think that at this time, what we need to ensure is that we have not had any abuse of, uh, of data. And then just to add to a point made quite rightly by Mr. Alvaro, there should um, be a, a proper basis for the TFTP. We've been discussing this for some years now. And I'm not sure whether we need a, our own um, s separate and uh, special program, even if this one is uh, suspended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mulder. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, the approach of the Commission has been correct one. I think we have posed the right questions, but we have to prepare ourselves that we do not get any answers that are satisfactory. And then I would uh, like to come back to what several colleagues have already mentioned. At the moment, we give data to the United States, and they can more or less do as they see fit. Uh, we cannot control it sufficiently, in my view. And the only solution is that we establish ourselves some kind of a center in which we collect the data, and then only at certain requests from the United States we give the data, not as we do at the moment in bulk, and they can do what they like to do it. And I would like to know from the Commission what are the prospects, budgetary as well, that we could do that in Europe in the short term. Are preparations on the way to do it? that we collect our, the data ourselves, have a center here, and when the United States wants to have specific information, we can give it to them or not. Thank you. Honorable Borghezio. Thank you very much, Chairman. It's always a great, huge privilege to speak last. Now, um, last but two, actually. Mr. Bur well, almost at the end in that case. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, for situating me in that sequence. Uh, my question is very uh, short and to the point. I have every respect for um, you, Commissioner, but as spokesperson for the Commission, sometimes it sounds a little bit to me like Alice in Wonderland. This is not um, something where we can simply go to – it's not evening prayers. Um, the EU um, needs to be in control of certain things. We saw from Echelon uh, that the Americans are on top of this, um, but they are alone in that position. And my question is, what can we do in practical terms? Um, let's not forget this is the economic, industrial, privacy-relevant um, information from the EU, uh, from EU citizens, and this is information which may be used against European interests. Um, you have talked about oversight and uh, control, and I want to know exactly what has been happening, because it does seem to me uh, that um, either people have not, they have not had the, the knowledge or not had the technology, and I, I'm interested which one it is. Köszönöm szépen. Azt gondolom, hogy a transzparencia, az átláthatóság követelménye az diktálja, hogy a világméretű megfigyelési bot. Obviously, we're talking about transparency here, and this transparency 
um, in the connection with mass data surveillance uh, needs requires us to clarify what can really be done and European citizens uh, need to be uh, given answers and reassurances that transparency will be applied. We know that the NSA has collected data concerning EU citizens and this information is confidential. Uh, it's things like uh, confidential bank details. In that regard, we have this agreement between the EU and the US on uh, combating terrorism. And these uh, data then have been transferred uh, lawfully. That is one uh, hypothesis. But there's another hypothesis. And uh, according to what we've read in the press, it seems that it has been done, this has been done illegally. Information has uh, been uh, made available to the American authorities that shouldn't have been. So to sum up then, uh, uh, we need to, to uh, make it clear to, for citizens as to what's going on and what uh, means do we have available uh, to respond to this access uh, to uh, private data by the Americans. We need to know. Uh, for our citizens, what kind of information is involved, or whose information, or how does this information circulate? We know, of course, uh, the uh, general thrust of uh, our legal systems. We know that according to those legal systems, there are uh, criminal law offenses uh, being committed here, and we know who is committing them. So we have. Uh, traditions uh, in uh, case law and practices uh, which are uh, abhorrent and we find that our citizens are the victims of these procedures and uh, they are entitled to take legal action in the US. There is a specific visa uh, tribunal but there's also uh, other American courts uh, which are non-specialized courts uh, which uh, can also uh, be addressed with these cases. Uh, Commissioner Malmström. Yes, right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do you suspect that the category of targeted individuals whose data the NSA is interested in goes beyond those suspected of being involved in terrorism or perhaps serious organised crime? Um, Indeed, how precisely is the term terrorism defined? The U.S. in the past didn't regard or didn't seem to regard the IRA as terrorists or, for that matter, the Contras in uh, Central America uh, or, for that matter, the Islamists among the Syrian opposition. Can the actions of states be regarded as terrorist in this context? Uh, at a recent hearing, Mr. Applebaum, who uh, was concerned with wider NSA surveillance, claimed that investigative journalists and political activists who weren't involved in terrorism or other violence were also targeted. Um, how wide is the category of individuals that can be investigated legitimately under the agreement? Is that limited to terrorism? Now, at the time of the... Uh, swift agreement, the European Parliament, if my recollection serves me correctly, made the terms concerning safeguards against improper access a major term of the agreement. So if the US has indeed broken those terms, then it appears to me that the agreement as a whole has been broken, rendering the EU's obligations discharged. Uh, one final question, really. How has it been possible for the US to override the safeguards against proper access to the data? If those safeguards can't prevent the US from gaining improper access, then there's something wrong with the safeguards or the particular individuals implementing them. Thank you. Thank you. Now back to you, Commissioner Masson. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Let me first start by apologising to Mr. Albrecht. I didn't answer his question uh, be because it goes slightly outside this scope. As you know, there are two working groups, one between the US and, and the Council, where the Commission has, has no role to discuss uh, the different allegations on, on uh, snooping into two um, uh, EU uh, embassies uh, and others. We have very little information what's happening there. Uh, and the other one is the one where the DG Justin and, and DG Home is work concerning mainly data protection. And some of these issues are, are discussed this, and we will, of course, gradually try to, to achieve some, some conclusions and, and some report. And it's a little bit too early to say uh, what, what will come out of it and what actions it will lead to before also we have more, more clarity uh, on the, these issues. I've chosen to, to concentrate today only on the SWIFT. I know Mr. Preby will talk uh, about the, this working group this afternoon, or, or later this morning, maybe. Um, uh, the Commission has no intention to propose to set up an intelligence uh, centre. Uh, what has been discussed is whether we should have uh, extraction of data on European soil or some sort of European TFTP. Now, this, of course, could could be discussed uh, whether to do that or, or, or not, and we are looking at that in, in the, 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 uh, the communication uh, that, that we are working on. Uh, that, that has, has a lot of, of implications, whether then it would only be SWIFT data, because today money is transferred in many, many other ways. SWIFT is only one part uh, of that. There are many other ways to, to transfer uh, money, uh, and, and that has to be discussed in, in a broader uh, sentence, of course. Uh, when it comes to... Um, uh, the, the different uh, um, evaluations and revisions and, and, and the, the overseers that we have. We have, as until the first uh, articles appeared, no indication whatsoever that there has been any breach of the agreement. No indication whatsoever. Now, of course, all these allegations that, that also I have read about in media needs to, to be clarified, and that's why we are putting uh, questions there. The, the question that, that uh, Mr. Bronze put on, on the scope, that is defined in Article 2, what is terrorism, and of course that is also a question to be put. Have they gone beyond that for pure terrorism or, or uh, planning for terrorism? And, and the, the Article 2 is, is quite uh, precise in, in that in the agreement, uh, so you can see uh, how the definitions uh, are, are, are set there. Uh, the question that, that, that Sarah Ladford put is of course very, very important, because if leads extracted from SWIFT data related to an ongoing investigation on terrorism or financing of terrorism is after that they have looked at it given to any authority. That is one thing. That is according to the agreement uh, in, in general. Of course, one has to look at this. But if NSA or I had direct access to extract, that is something totally different. And uh, I agree with you that, that this needs absolutely to be, to be clarified. What do they mean by this? Because one thing is regulated in the agreement, one thing is not. And that is then, is then a breach of the agreement. So these are, are, are the first question uh, that, that I will put in this. So we have taken note of, of some of the questions that you have. They coincide very much with, with our own questions. And I think without further ado, I will also leave to, to, to um, the, the, the colleagues from, from SWIFT and Europol maybe to clarify some more technical questions uh, that have been put. Have we taken note of all the, the political questions related uh, to the, the allegations and the agreement? And I think I, I will stop here and, um, again, reiterating my availability and those of my services, of course, to, to regularly come and discuss these issues with you. Thank you very much. Yes, Commissioner, as it has been announced, we're going to be having Director of Europol, Mr. Re Rob Wainwright, and uh, Mrs. Blanche Petre, um, on, on representing the, the Council of SWIFT, which is the company at stake. But first, we should be hearing some words from... Mr. de Bocquelier from Belgian Data Protection Supervisor, Belgacom. I, I suggest, is in the room, I guess, Mr. de Bocquelier, yes, please, you've been invited. You're more than welcome to, to, to deliver some words with us, but I suggest you concentrate on this uh, SWIFT uh, and uh, its access by the National Security Agency, as it has been reported in the in the informations that uh, are on the grounds of this gathering of the Libya Inquiry Committee. You have the floor. Uh, thank you well, uh, Mr. Voorzitter. In verband met SWIFT. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in connection with SWIFT, I can, be, I can keep this brief. 
on the 25th of June 2006, it became clear that SWIFT was the object of a very extensive investigation uh, by the Treasury and the intelligence uh, services in the U.S. when it came to international uh, payment transactions, payments traffic. And then after months, indeed years, of discussion in, on the 8th of December 2008, there was a settlement, in other words, an agreement between the data protection authorities in Belgium and SWIFT, wherein SWIFT took certain privacy-related measures in order to protect its customers and the users of the network in particular, uh, but also citizens in, in general terms. In the wake of three uh, meetings after 2008, uh, we as the Belgian Data Protection Authority it, um, investigated as to whether this was being effectively implemented. And um, even now, there is n all we can say is that there were commitments uh, which SWIFT imposed upon itself in 2008, and there is everything to suggest that that's been properly respected. On top of this, there is no, nothing to suggest that there were any specific uh, problems uh, with regard to the processing of individual citizens' d data. There is a second uh, circuit of, as it were, surveillance, and this is the TFTP agreement. It's set out in the TFTP agreement um, with the so-called joint uh, assessment team EU-US, which has been mentioned already, and there are t uh, already two reports on that subject. And uh, there again, no um, particular difficulties have emerged with regard to data protection, as indicated by Commissioner Malmström. There is an overview of the uh, work um, at Europol undertaken by the GSB that did observe certain um, difficulties with regard to the implementation of the TFTP agreement, um, particularly as to the question, was this bulk transfer of data or not? Um, and this was uh, passed on to the Parliament, and I would make reference to that. Uh, with regard to SWIFT, um, all I can say is that at the present time there is no um, specific indication of data protection problems, and that is really all I can uh, say for the time being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. de Bocquelier. We, 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 we are aware that uh, on the allegations of access to Belcocom systems and uh, as related to, to all this SWIFT and SA issue, we will be having further chance to elaborate and discuss because we will be returning on the matter on our session of October the 3rd, October the 3rd, as it's been announced. So I suggest, so that we do not have any further delay, that as it was scheduled by 10 a.m. To, to have uh, Rob Wainwright on the podium, I suggest we proceed now to invite the director of Europol, Rob Wainwright, to exchange some views on this issue, and uh, then we will be hearing from our guest, Mrs. Blanche Petre, from the General Council of SWIFT, and then open again the floor for questions and answers. So, uh, uh, Mr. Wainwright, is he here? Yes, of course. I was looking for you. <laughs> there you are, of course. Of course, you're more than welcome to, to, to take the floor and extend your views with all of us. Thank you. If, 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 if you would like to share the podium with us, maybe, maybe it'll be good. I mean, just as it's been the case more than once, you're more than welcome to approach the podium so that everybody could see you and hear you better. Morning. 
question. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to uh, honourable members and other colleagues gathered here today. Um, and I'm happy to provide some, some short remarks from, from Europol regarding this particular interest, uh, in particular the inquiry's interest today, of course, into the allegations um, that the NSA has unauthorised access to SWIFT. Um, uh, there's nothing I can add, of course, to the remarks from Commissioner Malmström about the way in which um, the European Union is currently dealing with those allegations. Quite properly, it's for the Commissioner personally to deal with that. Um, uh, Europol provides as much assistance as possible, but in the meantime, of course, we are focused, as she said uh, in her concluding remarks, on the technical work of implementing uh, those parts of the agreement which Europol has responsibility for working on. Uh, of course, Europol is happy to, to support the inquiry in any way, and, we will sh and I will share some remarks today. It's important to stress, however, there are some natural limitations to that. I'm not here today to represent the intelligence community uh, in Europe. Uh, Europol is not, absolutely not, an intelligence agency. It very much works in the law enforcement environment, uh, and our natural partners are police, customs, and border guards, for example, in the fight against serious international crime and terrorism. Having said that, even though our regular cooperation is with law enforcement partners, uh, we of course have some experience, albeit limited, of working with security services in Europe, particularly on counter-terrorism. The EU declaration on com combating terrorism in 2004 following the terrorist attack in Madrid, for example, uh, established the counter-terrorist task force uh, at Europol on a temporary basis and specifically encourage greater cooperation between Europol and those security services. So we have some uh, experience, of course. However, in terms of information handling, um, all personal data received and used by Europol is regulated uh, by the same highly robust data protection framework that committee members are familiar with. And that's irrespective, of course, of the original source of that material. This framework regulates the lawfulness of information collected and sent to Europol by the competent authorities of the Member States, and of course Europol is forbidden to receive or store any data that has been collected outside our legal framework or in a way that is not consistent with the national law of that Member State. Furthermore, all information containing personal data is channeled to Europol via dedicated national units established in national police agencies in the member states and in the countries with which we have a cooperation agreement. Now, it's still possible, of course, within the limits of, of our legal framework that some of the data received by Europol in this way originates from an intelligence service in the member state uh, in the way that it has been legitimately accessed and used by police according to the national law, especially in the fight against terrorism, and shared with Europol uh, in a sanitized way. And because it's sanitized, to protect the sensitivity of the original source, it's normally not possible for Europol to identify the true source of that material. My perception, however, is that only a very, very small proportion of Europol's information derives from intelligence agencies. Our mandate, culture and way of working, as I said earlier, very much is part of the police world. Now, we have a similar type of cooperation with the United States authorities. Working arrangements have been established with several U.S. federal law enforcement authorities. Seven of them have liaison officers uh, resident in our headquarters, for example. And in the last 12 months, that cooperation led, for example, to 50 operations of a high uh, high-profile international nature involving those U.S. law enforcement agencies, and this covers the full range of serious international crime. In the area of counterterrorism, Europol, of course, also has good cooperation with the United States, and here it is also um, uh, focused on the law enforcement community. We have no contacts um, at all with the CIA or the NSA, none at all. Exchange of the information with U.S. authorities, uh, of course, is regulated also by that same data protection framework that governs Europol's work. And so in terms of what we receive from the U.S., those same principles of lawfulness, proportionality, relevance, for example, apply as they do in the case of working with member states. 
Again, it's possible, at least in theory, that some of the U.S. information that is shared with Europol originates from the intelligence community. It's even possible that some of this uh, originates from the NSA. But I think it's even less likely in this case um, because of a restrictive interpretation of the Europol-U.S. cooperation agreement that the U.S. authority applies in preventing the United States from sharing any classified information with Europol apart from in the very specific framework regulated by the TFTP agreement. So this is important. Uh, the U.S. authorities, by its own policy and interpretation of its legal agreement with Europol, will not share classified information with Europol, apart from in the specific uh, uh, context of the TFTP agreement. This means that our, uh, uh, that our knowledge of the NSA and the intelligence community broadly in the United States is very low, certainly given um, the way in which Europol works. And in terms of the wider debate, therefore, on the inquiry that, uh, regarding NSA activities, we have no cooperation with NSA and no record of receiving any NSA information or any, at least, that has been attributed to the NSA. Now, turning to the TFTP agreement itself, um, I have no information beyond that which Commissioner Malmstrom has shared with you. Of course, I have a duty to make sure that she is also fully informed by, by Europol on these matters, and she would have reflected that in her opening statement today if I was in receipt of any evidence that uh, conflicted with what she uh, shared with you. In fact, our own operational exchanges on these technical implementation of the TFTP with the United States officials show the same position that the Commissioner has just shared with you. At Europol, of course, we remain committed to our operational task as strictly legislated for in the TFTP agreement. We remain focused on doing that specific job as well as possible. And according to the most recent JSB report, we've now reached a good standard of implementing that task, even though it's in very difficult and complex circumstances, as you are well aware of. And, of course, in due course, the, com the Commission will report about the value of, of the agreement. I know that's not the purpose of today's hearing, so I won't comment further on that. It's worth recalling, however, that the agreement benefits from uh, the full application of Europol's data protection framework, in including, of course, the full independent scrutiny by our joint supervisory body, as well as, of course, the other specific safeguards applied in the agreement. In terms of our implementation of the agreement, Europol has always worked with officials from the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Uh, we have no record of working uh, with any members of the U.S. intelligence community, for example, the CIA and NSA, or at least none that have been identified as such to us as part of the team working at the Department of Treasury. And to uh, reiterate what the Commissioner said, also at our operational level, these officials have always maintained that the data obtained by the United States and the TFTP agreement is unique and is not obtained from other sources. That's what they have told us at the operational level. And from these exchanges also, therefore, we have no information that would indicate that uh, the NSA has additional direct access to the data operated by SWIFT. Having said that, because of the nature of the way in which we work, it's unlikely that Europol would have that information anyhow. But I can uh, state today that we have no information or evidence uh, to either confirm or deny the allegations that have appeared in the press regarding the NSA. So in conclusion, therefore, I would say that our regular cooperation, including in regard to the TFTP agreement, is about fighting crime and terrorism as a law enforcement agency, not an intelligence service. We have no direct cooperation with NSA or CIA. Some uh, broader experience of working with security services of the member states, however. Exchange of all our personal data is by and through Europol is regulated by our strong data protection framework. It's possible that some of the information that we process, of course, does, is, does originate in the intelligence community, but it is always sanitized to protect the source um, as it is passed through the Europol channel, and our perception is that it is a very small amount of the work that we do. We, of course, support the Committee's important inquiry in this area as much as possible, 
Uh, we will support the Commission's important task of demanding further information from the United States authorities, um, and I hope and I'm ready to answer any questions that committee members might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright. I suggest we hear now from Mrs. Petra, from the General Counsel of SWIFT. Please, if you thank may you proceed Chairman. before the questions and answers. Um, thank you, and thank you for giving SWIFT uh, the opportunity to speak today uh, before the Commission. Uh, SWIFT takes uh, its data, res data protection responsibilities extremely seriously, and, and we recognize the work that your committee is doing on, on data protection. As a company, we are really focused on security and data protection, and therefore we share very much the concerns of, of the European Parliament. Uh, and we support its work, and uh, we will be happy to cooperate as much as we can. So what I propose to do to give you first a quick oversight overview on, on SWIFT, on the company, and then given the objective of this uh, hearing, I will focus on security, security on SWIFT, and security of the TFTP system. So first, SWIFT. Uh, SWIFT is, uh, for those of you who do not know, SWIFT is a, a mid-sized private European company. Uh, our headquarter is uh, here in Belgium. We were created in uh, 1973 as a, as a cooperative. And the mission of SWIFT was to replace the, the telex and to facilitate the secure exchange of financial messages between financial institutions. So security is still, 40 years later, key to our mission and core uh, to, to our business, as well as integrity and the confidentiality of our customers' data has always been at the highest priority. So what, what service do we provide? Again, uh, we are a secure messaging service provider. We are not a bank. We are not a clearing or settlement system. Um, we provide messaging service um, between four financial institutions as well as for, for corporates. We have today 10,000 customers connected to our system. Very important, we do not hold money, we do not hold accounts, and also we do not uh, give access or the private individuals have no access and no, to, cannot use our system. So our system is only used by financial institutions. We operate in more than 200 countries. In addition, so we are not only a service provider, but also we are a standardization body uh, for, the, for the community, for the financial industry. And uh, we issue um, templates, message templates, financial messages templates, where you have probably heard of Swift, Swift format or Swift big code. So we uh, implement these standards, which can be used not only on the Swift system, but also on any other network or any other communication uh, means. So that, that was Swift, in a nutshell. I propose now to uh, describe the security uh, within SWIFT system. Again, um, we operate our services to the highest data protection and security standards. Um, I, I will repeat that, but clearly data protection is, is key to what we do. Um, it is part of our core, core mission to maintain the availability, the confidentiality, and the integrity of customers' data. And we have a zero tolerance for incidents for integrity or confidentiality incidents. It is really at the center, security being at the center of our activities, it is of the utmost importance for our customers. If um, the customers trust SWIFT and work with SWIFT because we can provide a secure uh, service. And we continuously invest, reinvest in protections to, which, to ensure that we are fit for, for purpose. And more, more importantly, we also invest and prepare ourselves to uh, what we know is an evolving threat landscape. So we are not complacent, and we cannot be complacent. Now let's, let me give you some of the um, features, security features that, that we have implemented in our system. We have both logical and, phys uh, and um, physical controls. So the first, one, the first uh, control of uh, security that we have is encryption. Our messages are encrypted, SWIFT messages are encrypted, and we have multiple layers of, of uh, encryptions. 
and we use the uh, international, the, the state-of-the-art encryption technology. So the messages are encrypted from the day they enter, from the moment they enter the system to the moment they leave the system, switch system. And during a storage, our messages, the messages are encrypted. We have firewalls, uh, multiple layer of firewalls implemented into our architecture. And we ensure that the servers where the data are stored are shielded away from threats. Uh, threats, internal threats or external threats. Important, there is no access to internet. Our network has no access to the internet. Our production environment is completely um, standalone without any access to internet. We have also segregation of duties. Internally, we segregate duties. We have uh, numerous detection systems. Uh, we detect, we do intrusion detection, make, um, intrusion detection system to protect um, the um, integrity of our network. We also have tools which analyze the network behavior. So if something goes, uh, is, is unusual, we will detect it immediately. We have uh, crisis management practices. Uh, we do practice on an ongoing basis uh, threat, uh, well, simulation of threats. Um, we have also intrusion testing program. Uh, these are programs are, are run on a uh, regular basis to make sure that uh, we, have, we can take regular and timely actions if we detect anything. We have also we, uh, have guidelines to uh, destruct the data, the, our customers' data, um, when we, cannot, we do not keep them anymore. So we have uh, some guidelines, for, not only for the maintenance, but also for the disposal of, of the computers, the hard disk, so that we ensure that the data cannot be recovered. Staff vetting procedures, we do staff vetting. Uh, we have uh, background screening, checking, reference checking. And we have, of course, physical access control. Very important, we do not only access or uh, control the physical access to our operating center, but even within the operating center, we have very strict access control to our computers. We, have, we use access tokens, we use personal identification, biometrics, uh, and also importantly, we have audit trails, so we, can, we know at, at every time whether our system has been accessed unauthorizedly or not. Finally, we monitor we monitor on an ongoing basis, we monitor the, uh, the, flow, the data flow and our systems. Uh, we know that cyber threats evolve and uh, become more and more sophisticated. And therefore, we have to continue to, continue to monitor the threats, the vulnerabilities. And we continuously reassess the risk when we see something. And we improve or invest uh, in new controls when, when relevant. And finally, uh, we do on a regular basis cyber exercise um, so that's, that's so that we are well prepared in, in case of an attack. So now security, as I said, is key to our, uh, to our mission. And that's why security is also um, subject to extended external review. I would say that the first uh, important review that, that uh, we are subject to is by the overseers. Uh, the central bank. We are overseen by the G10 central banks uh, and they, they oversee SWIFT um, to ensure that we have appropriate process, procedures, technical controls in place uh, to ensure that customer data are at all time uh, protected. The National Bank of Belgium is our lead overseer because we are uh, incorporated here in Belgium but uh, we have other central banks from, from the ECB, of course, is one of our overseers, and the Bank of England, the Fed, so the G10 central banks. Uh, in addition to this oversight, external oversight, we have also, obviously, internal, of course, internal audits, but more, more than that, we subject ourselves to independent external review, and we follow the uh, internationally recognized standards set by the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. So on an annual basis, we issue a report according to this standard. 
So I have summarized some security controls that we have. Uh, of course, it's not an exhaustive list. We, and as I said, we are really on an ongoing basis reviewing all these security measures, and we are adding new controls, new features uh, to enable us to detect any unauthorized use. So we have read, uh, as, as you all did, uh, the recent allegations in the press, uh, we, and, and we have taken these allegations very, very seriously. So our monitoring uh, investigation tools are in place, and I can tell you today, and I can assure you today, that we have no evidence to suggest that there has been any unauthorized access to our network or our data. Uh, if this were the case, uh, we would be extremely concerned. And you can be assured that we will continue to monitor and, uh, cyber, any cyber security, security threats. And whenever we believe there is any risk to security of our services, we will investigate and take whatever actions uh, we deem appropriate to mitigate the risk. So this was on, on SWIFT security and SWIFT system, SWIFT system security. I now would like to say a few words on uh, the TFTP and on data requests in general. So as a private company, um, SWIFT is of course not immune of, uh, from lawful requests by, by authorities. Back in 1993, we have developed a policy for, for compliance with requests from authorities. And this compliance policy was communicated to our board, by our board to all our customers it has been incorporated into our contract with the customers uh, and um, in, in the so-called user handbook. It is even um, published on our website. So our policy clearly states that while we take all necessary measures to ensure the highest degree of data protection, integrity and confidentiality, we have to comply with legally binding requests uh, issued by competent authorities. If and when we are compelled to provide data uh, to authorities, we would do so respecting any relevant agreements. But also we have a policy to make sure that uh, we would um, seek protection of our customers' data. We would communicate uh, to the authorities the basic data, principles, uh, data protection principles. And lastly, we would inform our customer if and when we are compelled to provide their data to authorities. This has been our policy, and uh, even the Belgian Privacy Commission, I think, acknowledged our policy back in 98, uh, 2008. Now, the authorities can obtain financial information. They can come to SWIFT, but they can obtain financial information from any other financial institutions. And this is, this is something which is, I believe, quite recurrent. And they can obtain, for example, SWIFT messages, whether they, these messages have been transferred in our system or outside of our system. Now, a few words on the TFTP. Um, yes, on the TFTP. Um, okay, thank you. So we, we, you, you have seen in the, there is this, uh, the TFTP agreement, which provides a certain number of safeguards. In addition to these safeguards, SWIFT has uh, implemented as representative on site to verify all the searches. We have also um, independent external and internal auditors which are verifying that there is no backdoor to our system. Um, so, and today again, I would uh, confirm to you that we have absolutely no reason to believe that ha there has been any unauthorized access to, our t to the TFTP system. So to conclude, uh, we have no evidence to suggest that there has been ever unauthorized access to our system or our data. We uh, keep um, our data protection is critical for SWIFT, and the trust in the system is also critical. Uh, we will continue to comply with the law, um, but as our activity is global, uh, we, will op we operate today in a competitive landscape and uh, it is extremely important for SWIFT not to be caught in the middle. 
So we appreciate the effort of the Parliament in that respect, uh, and we will continue to continue, for, to, continue to work with you uh, in this important uh, work on data protection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright, Mrs. Petrie. Now we are going to proceed the same way we did before with Commissioner Malmström. We're going to hear first from the rapporteurs, then the shadows, and additionally, there will be some second round for the rest of the members. I insist again, two minutes each, because uh, the scheduled time is for the next hour for the questions and answers, and uh, the list is not short. So let's get started again by our rapporteur, Mr. Moraes. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Can I just say very quickly first, before you broke off from uh, Mr. de Buccalier, uh, that um, the shadows uh, and some of the members had asked specifically about the allegations of GCHQ um, um, infiltration of Belgcom systems, uh, which Mr. de Buccalier didn't mention, that this is the subject of the 3rd of October uh, debate, and we have invited UK representatives as well as him and uh, Belgacom representatives. So that's what the subject of the 3rd of October um, uh, debate is going to be. Um, secondly, on the um, Rob Wainwright's um, presentation, if I read correctly um, his presentation, I don't know what other members felt, um, Europol has a particular role under the 2010 agreement and if I read correctly, towards the end of your presentation, uh, Mr Wainwright, you, you were basically saying that you didn't have any knowledge of what the NSA and also what the CIA were doing. So basically that leaves us with an admission that you really don't know what they were doing and therefore have no knowledge of the allegations. So it really leaves us with, I mean, we could keep pushing you on this, which is one of the purposes of our inquiry, but I don't know how much I want to push a senior British police officer. Um, um, I, could, I could do that if you want me to, but could I just get on to the, maybe I'll leave that to other colleagues, I could get on to um, the question of independent supervision under Article 12. Um, I mean, could you just comment on what would be an efficient structure for EU supervision of the agreement, and also what do you see the role of Europol now, because many of the people in this room spent a lot of time on the SWIFT agreement and Europol's position in this, and of course we respect the position of Europol in many other areas, but it had a particular role. Now that role has been um, uh, questioned, obviously. You don't have any knowledge of, of these allegations, as I think is what you said. Um, so perhaps a comment on that, but the comment on the future as well. On SWIFT, a question to SWIFT. Could I just ask, I mean, I know you're general counsel and you have to be very legalistic about this, but the report in the Washington Post shows that the US has been able to read uh, SWIFT printer traffic since 2006. Um, could you specifically comment on that, despite all the encryption and other um, issues that you mentioned, the firewalls? That's what the Washington Post was saying. So could you comment on, on, on how that contradicts what you're talking about today? Thank you. Herr Barro. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, please let me be brief because uh, Claude Moras has already asked most of the questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Wainwright, Mrs. Peter, for being here with us. Um, maybe just a brief question in addition to what Claude already has asked concerning Europol. Um, first of all, since uh, you stated, as you know better probably than we, that uh, the task of Europol is to deal with law enforcement agencies and not with secret services. But in terms of the SWIFT uh, TFTP agreement, um, could you agree with me that the verification of the U.S. request might be better done by Eurojust instead of Europol, um, which uh, could help also concerning your burdens? And basically, I'm not surprised if you don't know that the NSA or any other secret service has put forward data to you, probably they wouldn't tell you if they would. Um, that is one issue. And uh, one other thing um, concerning uh, SWIFT, uh, again, thank you very much, Madame Petre, for coming forward with the information. Um, I think our task as legislators is to ensure that uh, you have legal certainty when it comes to what you can do and what you can't do, and uh, maybe 
you could agree that the answer to Mr. Moraz's question could be that you also would not know if any secret services tapping underseas cable which transmit the information into your system. You might have a look that within you don't have a mole, hopefully, um, but if via the transaction phase from A to B it is tapped, I suppose it's impossible for you to see if data has been addressed or not. But again, I said I remain brief, and actually for this, so to, maybe as a last question to both, could you imagine that it does make sense in case the allegations are not removed entirely to suspend, i.e. terminate the agreement? Thank you. Thank you. Herr Voss. Thank you. I've got about four questions. I'll just wait a, a moment. First of all, you don't have any knowledge as to whether the NSA has access to SWIFT or other databases, you say, but in general I would ask the question, are there any particular uh, inquiries uh, like these press reports, uh, as Mr. Alvaro has touched on as well? Uh, is it possible to acknowledge any such action if this is happening anywhere on the network? And then, is there any cooperation between Europol, Stroke, SWIFT, and the NSA? and in addition to that, cooperation with other U.S. authorities. And my last question, particularly a question directed at Europol, what would the impact be uh, if uh, we were to withdraw from the TFTP? What would the impact be on Europol in its uh, fight against criminality and terrorism? Mrs. Lindeveld. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. It's actually ironic, as we are having this debate, the boss of the Europol Cybercrime Center is tweeting that he's at a cybercrime conference where the U.S. Attorney Keith Becker says, you have all the tools inside Europol to conduct large-scale international cybercrime investigations. Uh, good, because that was going to be my question to Mr. Wainwright. You are ironically based in the Netherlands, in The Hague, the same country uh, as the main SWIFT server. Um, we've heard Mrs. Petter testify that they've not been able to establish unauthorized access to the service, but she says that this has been overseen by institutions like the ECB. I would like to know what kind of expertise uh, uh, SWIFT is using to establish that no unauthorized access has taken place or indeed could take place because you may use firewalls and encryption. Now, I'm, you know, technically I'm, I'm, I'm a zero, but I read the newspapers and, um, you know, we've learned that the U.S. Uh, government has let's say, cracked encryption systems has actually convinced certain companies to uh, uh, help them circumvent the encryption system. So I'm not very convinced by the, by the argument. But I would like to get the main answer from Mr. Wainwright um, about the, the security of the systems. Will you, will your cybercrime unit uh, investigate the security of the SWIFT systems? Uh, in that respect, uh, I would also like to express my deep disappointment and dismay at the refusal of the Dutch ministers responsible for this uh, to appear before this committee because, um, you know, they say we leave it to this working group of EU uh, and U.S. civil servants, but this is a, a highly political question. If we cannot guarantee the security of our systems, if the U.S. can break in, any other country can. We need to be able to rely on the, the security um, of systems. And then finally, to, again, a question to uh, SWIFT. SWIFT says, yes, I'm concluding, Chair. SWIFT says we have to comply with subpoenas, requests of uh, third country governments. Yes, but you also have to comply with EU law. How do you deal with this type of subpoenas and requests from governments other than the US? Thank you. Herr Albrecht. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much also for your willingness to be here and to be so open on, 
what you do. Um, I would like to follow up to what Sophie Infit just asked, because I would really like to know, is there any request, uh, Mr. Rainwright, of a uh, member state's police authority to investigate with Europol's cybercrime center together in any of these uh, possible breaches? Because this is not only a breach to security, this is also a crime. Cybercrime is a crime. We just passed a directive on that in the European Parliament. We had many debates. Uh, still, there are some open questions, but uh, obviously it's clear that if there would be a breach to the security systems of uh, information systems in Europe, it would be uh, a, a cybercrime. And I think that it would be up to the authorities and member states and of course, also up to you and your cybercrime center to investigate these possible uh, crimes. And of course, cri criminals will not help us with that. So if we just say, let's ask some questions to those who breach those systems, I don't think that will help. We can ask them about the lawfulness of their request. And that's my question to uh, uh, Ms. Petra, because I... Um, Really question, when you say there has been, you're not aware of any un unauthorized ex access. I mean, that means unauthorized in the meaning that you have not authorized it. And there I would like to know, how do you assess this as authorization? I mean, if there is a, an, a request by the NSA based on the program Bull Run or Follow the Money without a basis in EU law. Do you authorize that? I mean, you, you are not allowed to talk about that, obviously, because you get uh, national security letters or whatever. Uh, so uh, my impression is that either we get this sorted out or we have to clarify with investigators how companies authorize requests. Because if SWIFT is authorizing requests which are not based in EU law, then police authorities need to stop that because it's an infringement to our cybercrime rules and to our cybersecurity standards and our data protection rules. I mean, of course, this can occur in two diplomatic conflicts, but that's then up to us politicians to solve that. Before, I think those things need to be sorted out. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Mr. Wainwright, you make clear that Europol is a, a black box and that has to be changed. In discussions uh, with uh, uh, on the regulation of Europol, now, Mr. Wainwright, where, what do you think is happening with these data from the, the NSA? You're saying, oh, uh, it isn't very much. We don't really deal with that sort of thing, but how do you deal with computer security at Europol in general? How do you deal with it from a technical perspective? I would like to know how you address that. Then secondly, uh, the next point is that uh, SWIFT uh, doesn't have any information, doesn't work together with the NSA, and uh, there's no infringement of the treaties. How do you achieve this in uh, practice? You say this. Uh, you claim that. I can't do much with what you're saying. How do you actually, how, how does this actually work? I'd be very interested to know. And uh, Ms. Petra, you said you comply with uh, the highest level of data standards. Uh, what are the uh, reasons for that? You mentioned a lot of examples. What, is the, what are the rules governing that? And what is the basis on which uh, this uh, th that system can operate? How can you really know that uh, you're not uh, being uh, monitored or, or uh, tapped in any way? Perhaps I'm being a bit uh, naive here, but I think uh, uh, I would like to have those questions answered. Thank you. Now, as we proceeded the first round, we're going to be having some replies from this first round of questions and then opening an additional floor for the rest of the members. So if you please 
May may respond to this first round of questionings, please. You both, Mr. Wainwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for those questions, uh, many of which concerned um, um, Europol and the NSA. Well, there isn't a Europol on the NSA. Let me uh, make that clear again. Um, uh, we have no direct cooperation with with this agency, um, and neither do we have a mandate uh, to investigate any alleged breaches of international law by this agency. That's very clear. Well, we have no mandate. Let me, let me clear that, Mr. Albrecht. Let me clarify one more time, if I may. Um, our mandate is to investigate cybercrime um, at the request of member states' competent authorities. Uh, to answer your specific question, no, we have received no request uh, from any police authority in any member state to investigate any of the allegations that are the subject of this committee's inquiry, none at all. It's important to realize, which is the point I tried to make, um, first of all, that Europol's mandate does not cover possibilities, uh, in this case, for example, to investigate suspected acts of state-sponsored espionage, which uh, what these allegations concern. So we have also never received a request at any point from any member state, for example, to investigate any alleged breaches by China of um, security systems in the European Union. Uh, we have never received these uh, requests, um, and we are unlikely to because it conflicts with our basic mandate. Um, we, so this also allow, puts us in a position where we simply don't know, I'm afraid, about NSA activity. Uh, we have no information in the files, even in the context of, the, of our work on the TFTP agreement, to indicate, to either confirm or deny any of the allegations that have been made um, um, over, the, over the recent months. Now, that's not to say that somehow Europol is failing in this duty or is ignorant. It's simply a different part of the world in which we operate in, uh, and it's not something that we have a mandate to be involved in, and we have received no such request to investigate this further. Um, Mr. Marais also asked about the role of Europol uh, in the agreement. Does it call into questions? Mr. Alvaro asked also whether or not it would be better that Eurojust uh, was uh, performing the check on Article 4. That's a political decision, and it was a decision made by the legislators at the time not to give the task to Eurojust, but to Europol. You might reflect uh, with hindsight whether or not that was the right decision. In the meantime, uh, we have our duty to fulfill the expectations of the legislator in difficult circumstances. We've discussed our performance and conduct in doing that many times. Um, and uh, I recall, as I said earlier, what the most recent re findings of the JSB report were regarding that. In terms of the future, well, we are committed still, of course, still 100 percent to implementing the agreement. Um, were the agreement to be modified in the future, then, then it's something we would have to consider in the future. For the moment, our job is technical and operational in nature to do what the legislators also here in Parliament have asked us to do to the best of our abilities, and that's what we are focused on doing. The impact, as Mr. Voss asked about the loss of the TFTP agreement, I think uh, it's best that we wait for uh, the report that the Commission will soon issue regarding uh, the value of the program. We have contributed to that report, uh, including um, our estimates of the number of uh, unique investigative leads uh, that the U.S. authorities have provided Euro uh, Europe following um, the work of the TFTP, but this is not the subject of today. Um, I think as one more point perhaps as a first round of answers, which is regarding the specific question from Ms. Ernst about um, the computer security and information security arrangements at Europol. Uh, because of the mandate we've been given uh, to operate as the European Cybercrime Center, of course we take this very, very seriously. Uh, also because of the way in which we record and store so, so much personal data. Uh, so you will find at Europol, I think, the highest standards of, of information security. And to date, at least, we have not had uh, a major compromise in, in our data security. That's uh, because of the uh, investment that we have made in making sure that it is as ro robust as possible. That's uh, enough for the moment from the first round. Let's hear first from the we will uh, thank, you, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I will answer to the, to the first question about the switch 
to traffic. Yes, we have read the same thing. And, and at SWIFT, we really was wonder. I'm sorry. Um, it may be, we don't know, but it may be that banks who are sending messages using SWIFT or not SWIFT, they can print the message, the SWIFT format, and they, can, they have these printed uh, traffic uh, on, on site. So it can be that the, the NSA have been able to read or access those printed traffic. So that's, that's the explanation that we have. The, uh, on the second question about um, how do we know that we are not tapped, what type of standards do we use, what type of uh, encryption do we use, as we heard, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, prove that you have not been tapped. But, but of course, what I've tried to explain is that we have a lot of system, security system and controls in place to try to uh, identify those unauthorized access. Maybe, maybe a few words on encryption. Uh, we use the uh, highest international standards for our encryption mechanism. And um, yesterday, the uh, encryption expert at SWIFT uh, reminded me that uh, these encryption are, uh, in fact, initially uh, initiated here or, or discovered here in Europe by, by two Belgium, Belgium guys, in fact. What we do and what uh, also this uh, expert told me that we are using external third-party expertise. We are on an ongoing basis working with university, with private security experts to make sure that we have the highest uh, mechanism uh, as available. And we work, for example, here in Belgium, we work with the university in Leuven. On um, authorization, who is authorized, who is not authorized to access our data, I think the data, are, are the data that we have are our customers' data. So the customers are authorized to access those data. And again, we have this compliance policy in place where we clearly tell our customers that we will not voluntarily give the, the customer's data to a, a, a third party, to an authority. This is really a principle. We have to be uh, legally compelled. We have to receive a legally binding request order to provide the data to an authority. Of course, we are a global company, uh, and we may be caught sometimes in the middle of two different systems, two different legal systems. And that is why uh, we really call uh, for a legal framework, a legal certainty to enable a company like SWIFT to operate globally. Um, I think I have tried to answer to, to all the questions. Okay. Mrs. Invild would like to, to reformulate yeah, just the additional to, points. No, just two, I suggest for one minute and two then seconds, we open less for than, the rest less of the Less than a minute, Chair. First of all, uh, I would like the questions that have been put to SWIFT to be sent to them in writing, and I'd like to get an answer in writing, because frankly, I don't feel that I got any answer at all. Secondly, I would like to make sure I understood correctly when Mr. Wainwright said, not a single member state has requested Europol to investigate a possible breach or even the possibility of an unauthorized access at the SWIFT server. Is that correct? Nobody has requested an investigation. Isn't that remarkable? Okay. Now, before, before turning back to you, I suggest let's hear from the rest of the members. Eh? Eh? Or would you like to react just on the spot? Okay, do it. Do it. Uh, Ms. Infeld, this is the, your understanding is correct. We have received no request from any member state to investigate any alleged breaches connected with any aspect of this inquiry that the committee has established, including the, that related to the alleged unauthorized um, intrusion into SWIFT. Let's, let's open some floor for the rest of the members. I suggest have it in mind, no more than two minutes, because the, 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 the list is, is, is not short. Get started again, Mr. Picker. Thank you, Vorsitzende. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, well, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Wainwright and uh, Ms. Petre have uh, made things, certain things clear. There's a lot of claims and assumptions here, so it's necessary to get this clear from Europol that uh, they are, in fact, a law enforcement agency and not a security agency. 
there are certain tasks in relation to that, and I welcome the fact that Europol uses the highest uh, data protection standards and uh, uh, oversight. Uh, and it's good to hear that uh, that is uh, the reality, and that you express that here. You also said, Mr. Wainwright, that uh, uh, you have positive cooperation with American uh, law enforcement bodies. Which bodies, which authorities in the U.S. do you have a specific uh, cooperation uh, um, in terms of combating terrorism and crime? Can you give us any specific examples? Because when we're arguing these things, uh, we have to be able to say, well, this was a successful example of cooperation. And then my second question is to both of you, to Ms. Petre as well. Are there any indications to the effect that data from you has been transferred to authorized uh, partners and that then uh, they have fallen into the hands of other unauthorized persons? That would be my question. Thank you. Yeah, you Ms. Sippel, I'll try uh, to uh, not come back on questions that have already been asked by colleagues. Uh, thank you, Ms. Petra, for making clear. Uh, how often and with different uh, measures uh, we have to you have to act to ensure that the highest standards are applied and I would ask Europol and uh, Belgacom particularly whether they use such measures and, and can also guarantee such a high level of data protection obviously uh, we have uh, this problem if uh, a company uh, uh, gives uh, transfers data and uh, um, access opportunities to other companies in a given state, but uh, it does seem that uh, no one is actually monitoring how this operates. TFTP and the Treasury only collects uh, the data that we give them, yes, but that doesn't exclude other things. And I did mention the question before to the effect that there's no, uh, there can't be any security there. And then Another point concerning the debate in this committee, if Europol is not responsible uh, for dealing with uh, data-related infringements by Belgacom, by SWIFT, or anywhere else, uh, because it's a matter for the member states, who then, at European level, is responsible? Should we not have more coordination if we find that uh, individual member states are refusing or failing to act independently? Thank you, Ms. Ludford. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I mean, I think the same question arises as for the tele telephone companies um, and internet companies that are uh, around whom there are allegations uh, regarding the NSA. And that seems to me to boil down to the question of whether core systems at SWIFT and Visa, which has also been mentioned, were compromised or was there acquiescence to the demands that, that are uh, uh, alleged? So uh, what I would like to ask, I'm not entirely clear. Um, in the US, would SWIFT, and you're probably going to tell me you can't answer this question, cooperate with requests, uh, subpoenas or court orders to provide data outside the framework of the TFTP because I think Sophie asked um, how does SWIFT deal with subpoenas other than in the US. I'm not clear whether you would deal with subpoenas in the US. Or would you, you would say, no, I refer you to the TFTP agreement because that's the only um, context in which we can supply data. Um, but also, um, would financial institutions that are your member um, member organizations, would they inform you if they received subpoenas? So how, how big a picture do you have? Can I just add to those, I mean, I must admit, I find the most shocking allegations in the last three months are about the possible um, undermining of encryption standards. I mean, that has the potential to bring down the entire international economy, actually. And SWIFT is right in the frame. Uh, in terms of the safety and reliability of financial transactions. I mean, online shopping, digital economy, all depends on, our, on trust 
And if it is true that there is a deliberate backdoor undermining of them, well, I regard that as in incredible, uh, incredibly irresponsible, counterproductive, and so on. And, and I, would, uh, I would agree with those who say, who is investigating this? I haven't found anyone who admits to, whether in the UK or, or here in Brussels, who, who, is, who is doing anything about this. I mean, it, it's, it is stunning. So, Mr Wainwright, you are in the hot seat on this sort of thing. You are supposed to head up the European Cybercrime Unit. What's the point of having cybercrime laws? Or talk, I mean, we're endlessly talking. I have to say, when I suffered cybercrime in July, thank you very much, your head of uh, staff gave me a contact in the UK because I could not find anyone to report it to, a denial of service attack, which was quite extraordinary, and I'm taking that, that up with the UK authorities. But thank you that Europol was actually able to give me contact in the British police. Mrs. Ladford, Mrs. Morway. Köszönöm szépen, megint csak a európai állampolgárok és így magyar állampolgárok. Once again, I would like to speak on behalf of our citizens, European citizens and Hungarian citizens. And uh, what, what is the position exactly? We have here a situation where citizens' private banking details uh, and uh, that certain individuals, certain bodies in America, in the U.S., have access to those data. These agencies and uh, bodies have access to uh, Europeans' information on the uh, basis of a uh, principle of the right to information. That is regulated through a bilateral agreement between the EU and the USA. That is the principle, but could we envisage a possibility in which uh, the United States goes beyond that and the Patriot Act, uh, Para 215, uh, authorizes the Americans uh, to make a request or even issue a demand for uh, banking information, banking details from European citizens. If you look at uh, the specific uh, case law of uh, FISA, we find that uh, there are two levels of access to information here. There are certain conditions on two different levels. First of all, you have the general um, criminal law procedures with the sanctions that correspond. And then there's a second level, which is a kind of guarantee uh, concerning uh, terrorist acts. It seems to me that there isn't a safeguard system uh, or a real guarantee. We are far from that. This second level of procedure uh, means that uh, uh, there's a free-for-all in uh, finding information, in, in seeking data. And it seems to me that these are not uh, our activities that are involve uh, criminal offenses, not national security issues. And on the one hand, we have uh, Europol, and on the other hand, the U.S government through the Treasury, through the U.S. Treasury, acting in this way. Now, is that what the Americans also envisage by way of a system? Uh, would they not uh, accept that there is another level of procedure when it comes to anti-terrorist action? And in that case, it would be the Patriot Act that would apply in those circumstances whereby it would be possible to uh, use a much less uh, rigid system of guarantees, a much more flexible system of guarantees. I think that citizens, uh, the citizens' concern should be informed of this, and uh, you've touched on this, Madam, in your speech. How many cases have there been? of information being provided to concerned uh, involved citizens uh, regarding their data that have been uh, transferred. Mr. Lopez. Well, Mr. Wainwright, you recognize that Europol is based on political decisions. We realize that uh, a police body has uh, certain limitations uh, when it comes to dealing with citizens' data in Europe. 
they're almost incompatible tasks, if you like, but it was a political decision that we have to analyze going forward to see uh, how we can get this right. But I would ask, uh, you talked about the TFTP and uh, the report, and you said uh, that that is not the subject we're dealing with here today, but we are. We are dealing with the TFTP and all the uh, uh, leaks that have gone on. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Have there been leaks? Yes or no? And Ms. Petri, I would ask you about the memorandum or the agreement uh, with the United States government, uh, the agreement to provide information. If you give information in encrypted uh, form, then uh, you have to be facilitating in, uh, that uh, encryption. We need to know exactly what that memorandum says. What information are you required to give and in what circumstances, in what conditions? And my second question is, is there any other uh, authorities in those 200 countries where you work? Has any other authority requested data from you in the way that the U.S. government has? Is there any agreement, any kind of understanding or memorandum that you have with any state within the European Union or outside the European Union to the effect that there is, uh, you are obliged to provide information? Thank you. Thank you. And the last intervention, Mr. Bronze. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> We've been assured by Europol uh, that it has no relationship with the National Security Agency or the CIA in the US. Is it also true that it has no relationship with the security services of member states? Does it supply them with information or is it indeed supplied with information from them? Is the data held by Europol restricted to information relating to individuals suspected of crime? Would it ever extend to people who are not? suspected of crime. The reason I ask this is because the London Metropolitan Police uh, deliberately create a grey area between the two. It uses the same administrative unit to counteract both terrorism and violent political activity on the one hand and disapproved of political radicalism on the other. Um, in relation to cyber crime, uh, again, we've had the assurance that Europol has a duty to investigate cybercrime at the request of member states, but has not received any requests from member states. Would it also have a responsibility to investigate allegations from individuals and organisations against member states or the governments of third countries if they were suspected of committing cybercrime? Uh, Mrs. Petrie said that uh, SWIFT had a zero tolerance towards breaches of personal security. Have there been many breaches by staff, and how have they been dealt with? Um, we've heard that there have been no breaches of security uh, uh, on the part of um, uh, the security services. Have your investigations shown any attempt to gain data by uh, security services or individuals suspected of working for them. Um, again, Mrs. Petrie said that if compelled to provide data, uh, she would tell the person concerned. Uh, would SWIFT not be prevented by the laws of most member states, or for that matter, the laws of third countries, from doing that? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Intveld wanted very shortly to interview. Yeah, just say, I, I apologize to colleagues for coming back again. But somebody just pointed out to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Europol itself would actually have the right to ask member states to start an investigation into international crime. So is it possible, technically, theoretically, that Europol would ask a member state, let's say the Netherlands in this case, to conduct such an investigation? Okay, thank you. Well, uh, back to the speakers. Mr. Wainwright, please. Thank you very much. Mr. Perker asked um, what cooperation we have with the United States. I won't uh, spend too much time listing it. It is numerous, detailed, it's ongoing, it's in every area of international crime. 
Um, it's certainly with the FBI, uh, the Drugs Enforcement Administration, Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Secret Service, and so on. Much of that is in the field of cybercrime activity, which brings me in response to the question from Sarah Ludford. If we're not doing this, then what on earth are we doing in EC3? Well, we're very busy, I'm afraid, with uh, a very, very long list of cybercrime activities. Um, um, which include, for example, child sexual abuse, uh, the generation of uh, billions of euros of, of, uh, uh, from fraudulent activities online um, and other activities. This concerns the mandate of EC3, which is to investigate uh, the unauthorized activities of criminal groups on the Internet. As I said earlier, we do not have a mandate to uh, investigate any allegations of unauthorized activities by governments, for example. That's simply not part of our mandate. Just one uh, side point on that, which, is, which um, is interesting. We're dealing with the opposite end of the effects of this encryption uh, issue that you raised, uh, Ms. Ludford, um, which is we find in, in, in Europol that um, encryption standards nonetheless are, are quite demanding for, for police to deal with and, and the criminal exploitation of these encryption standards, even if they are uh, less than perfect, are still high enough um, to, to uh, allow criminal groups to profit increasingly uh, from the use of those, such as the, the Tor network online, which is increasingly attracting large-scale criminal activity, particularly in regard to child sex abuse, which, in which we recently concluded a major operation with our international partners in this area. So we suffer the other problem, and, and we suffer the unintended consequence, perhaps, of a natural desire by governments, for all the reasons that this committee is interested in, to make sure that we have the best possible enc encryption standards that are unbreakable. In those ways, it also gives an opportunity to very significant criminal syndicates as well. That's not me arguing not for us to do it, but there is an unintended consequence that I think policy and lawmakers should also be aware of. Um, regarding um, the, the direct question from Ms. Romero Lopez, uh, we simply have no evidence um, of the United States uh, being in breach of the TFTP agreement. And I repeat uh, something that Ms. Malmstrom said earlier. Uh, from our experience, the, the U.S. has been highly committed to implementing uh, all of the provisions of the agreement, certainly those that concern Europol, and will be responsive to our demands uh, for their activities to improve, improve over the three years in which the, uh, the agreement has been implemented. For the question from uh, Mr. Bronze, as I said in my opening statement, uh, we do not have direct uh, cooperation with uh, the CIA or NSA. We do have some cooperation historically with security services of the member states in the context of specific mandates given to us by council uh, to fight terrorism. Uh, this relationship has been sporadic um, and doesn't, uh, is not significant in terms of the overall nature of our work over the preceding 10 or 15 years. Uh, who do we hold data on? This is very much prescribed for in what are called the opening orders of all of the analysis files that we are permitted to hold and use at Europol. And here, each of these files uh, specify in, speci in, in great detail the, the nature of the criminal activity on which uh, the file concerns and the nature of the criminal activity in which we are only permitted to process personal data, therefore. Uh, and you'll find, therefore, that these are very specific definitions applied and rigorously checked by our data protection authorities in regard to specific forms of, of, of crime, such as uh, trafficking of heroin, certain forms of cybercrime activity, and so on. Uh, we don't, simply don't have the mandate to investigate governments uh, in response to Mr. Bronze's fourth question. Um, Ms. Infeld raises a good point, I think. Uh, yes, it's true that in our, in our legal, uh, legal framework there is a possibility for Europol to request a member state to investigate um, suspected criminal activity, providing, of course, it is uh, consistent with our mandate. And given that our mandate uh, does not extend to uh, so-called espionage or, or state activities, then in this area I think it would, we would find a legal difficulty in making uh, such a request, uh, but it's not something, uh, to be honest with you, that I, I have full legal advice on at the moment, even though it's a very good question. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright. Mrs. Petra. Uh, thank you. 
Um, so to the question, uh, how do we know that uh, data are not handed over to an authorized uh, party, I would like to say two things here uh, in addition to what we said before. First of all, under the TFTP agreement, there is this uh, clause which I think Mrs. Malcolm also referred to on onward transfer. So the uh, leads that are found th through the TFTP system can be given to other uh, authorities. Um, the second point that I would like to make is, is that, I mean, again, this is a concern for SWIFT, all these, these allegations, and we are seeking clarity of, on all these allegations. Uh, on the question of uh, whether there is a, we are subject to any other uh, program from other authorities, I can assure you that the TFTP program is the only program in place and we are not subject to similar program in the rest, uh, in the rest of the world. Are we subject to subpoena or to mandatory request? Yes, from time to time. And, and as I explained, we have to comply with, these, um, with legally binding uh, subpoena. Now, there was also another question. Do we know if, if banks, uh, when banks are subject themselves to a subpoena, when they receive subpoena? No, we don't. We don't, and to be honest, I think banks receive I don't know how many requests, mandatory requests, and they have also themselves a reporting obligation, so they would reveal to the authorities, to their supervisory authorities, uh, the, the information on, on customers or on criminal cases. Um, we have, yeah, there was also uh, another question, Are we, do we have cases where we were prevented by law to inform our customers? Uh, that there are cases in criminal investigation, whoever is, is uh, requested to provide information have to ke keep uh, these requests confidential. So it's not something unusual. Uh, and in which case, again, if we are compelled by law not to reveal to the customers that we have a request, we would not, we would not do it, obviously. Um, encryption. Um, there was a very uh, practical questions, how do we do if we, when we uh, provide the data requested under the TFTP agreement, what we do is we, we have to decrypt the data and to hand over these data to the TFTP, to the U.S. Treasury, decrypted obviously. We will not hand over uh, encrypted, encrypted data. Um, I think I've responded to, to all the questions, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you, Mrs. Petra. Well, before the concluding remarks uh, by the rapporteur, uh, Mrs. Latford asks for the floor for one minute. Quickly, if I may, to come back on Rob Wainwright's statement. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. I'm not complaining. I mean, I understand what you're saying, that criminals... Uh, can also in, in, exploit sound encryption standards, but, and you referred to uh, because states have an interest in the highest standards of encryption. My, my objection is that we are hearing, reading allegations that they might not have had an interest in the stricter standards of encryption, that there might have been forces, allegedly intelligence agencies, that was in, including in Europe, who were interested in undermining those encryption standards. I find that, and, and I really want to know who, at the level of policy, as well as investigation, and you've made clear your mandate does not allow you to uh, investigate state espionage, but as a matter of policy, surely the police, the financial system, all companies which are online, public and private services actually, there needs to be a public debate about this. I'm sorry if I'm sounding sort of agitated, because I am. I can't, I'm, I'm focusing on data protection regulation. Thank you, Mrs. And Ludford. I can't Thank you. believe how much we're shooting ourselves in the foot, or somebody is shooting us in the foot. Thank you, Mrs. Ludford. Now I have to give the floor to Mrs. Morphy for one minute, please, and then finish it. Thank you very much. As usual, I haven't received uh, any answer to any of my questions. I asked the representative of Europol whether it's possible or not that the American partner considers the Patriot Act as a legal basis for uh, collecting data from Europeans in addition to TFTP. I would like to have an answer to that. And from the representative of SWIFT, I asked very clearly how many uh, requests uh, have you had for data uh, from uh, 
European Union uh, uh, citizens on the basis of uh, either the, uh, the, the terrorism financing uh, um, agreement or from the United States uh, in general in the framework we are talking about today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, please, Mr. Wendt. My, my apologies for not answering your question. Um, I don't know enough about the uh, uh, specific legal framework of the Patriot Act to comment in detail. We certainly <coughs> are not aware directly of any request on the Patriot Act through the Europol channel. Of course, uh, a more general statement is that I would expect U.S. authorities engaged in fighting terrorism and, and crime to make use of a full range of, of legal instruments, including, for example, court orders and subpoenas, uh, served on financial institutions inside the United States and through its international partners in other parts of the world. Um, I think the U.S. has always made clear uh, that, that it has done that for many years in the same way as, as all countries have uh, in the European Union as well. But I'm afraid I don't know enough about the Patriot Act to answer your question in a very specific way. Mrs. Petra. Uh, I will try to answer to your question. How many requests have we received from under the TFTP agreement? I don't know by heart, but I think, if my memory is correct, I think there was a, a report uh, from the joint, joint review report which gives... The, some figures about the number of requests under the TFTP agreement. Now, under, in general, uh, do we receive many subpoena, many requests from the U.S. or from other authorities, specific requests? Honestly, no. Honestly, no. And if we receive the request, I can assure you that most of them are rejected because they are not legally binding or because we simply do not have the information. People believe that we have individual, individual customers or private data. We don't. We have just messages, bank-to-bank -bank messages. So the response to the subpoena are extremely uh, low. Thank you, Mrs. Petra. Now uh, our rapporteur, Mr. Marias, uh will uh, conclude in the afternoon instead of doing now, as I understood, uh, in, uh, at the end of the whole meeting, because we will continue after this uh, short uh, intermezzo, we will continue at 3 o'clock the inquiry, which will last the whole afternoon. So thank you, colleagues, for your uh, active participation. Thank you for our guests, for, uh, for all the information and being present. And then uh, with the inquiry, we will continue at 3 o'clock. And uh, now we go to uh, the agenda. It's the joint Yuri, Liebe, and AFCO committee meeting. I just let the people leave the room. One minute. Thank you. Uh, we did not introduce ourselves. <laughs> So,
Thank you, colleagues. Thank you there. If you want to take your seats. What is it? Thank you. After having completed the hearing we just had about the prism situation, now we proceed with the ordinary agenda of uh, Libya affairs. I'm chairing here. From now onwards, to get started with the rest of the order of the day, and we will be we will be having a point number four in the order of the day, which is the midterm review of the SOCOM program. First of all, let's adopt the agenda. If no objections, if no objections, we understand as agreed. No announcements, no further announcements, and uh, just to go through the approval of the minutes of the last meeting, July 9th, 2013, we consider them adopted. And then we go right on to point number four, to review the Stockholm program. We're having today a joint meeting, Libe, Afco and Yuri, on the report on the Stockholm program. We had a presentation, a draft report, for the summer break. We will be proceeding today to an exchange of views on the amendments that have been tabled. We're going to get started by our co-rapporteurs. I am rapporteur myself for the Libre Committee. But let's hear first from our co-rapporteurs from the Yuri and AFCO Committee, Mr. Berlinguer here, and Mr. Casini, to hear their comments. And then I will be delivering some, 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 some comments on, on my own draft report on behalf of the Libre Committee and the amendments as they have been tabled. So let's, let's get started by our co-rapporteurs, and then I will be, I will be uh, making some additional point on my own. Please, if you want to go first, Honorable Berlinguer, or Honorable Casini, chi preferisce? Honorable Berlinguer, come relatore per la Commissione Iuri. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think that this has been a very um, good initiative since we have got the mid-term review. I'm glad that we're now doing it with the different committees on a joint basis. And that's uh, true if you look at the documents prepared by the rapporteurs and also going through the amendments which have been put down. This will help stand us in good stead for um, the next um, stages in the procedure. Now, there's a series of amendments dealing with the need to facilitate free access um, for European citizens and to physically create a European um, justice area. So some of those amendments have indicated ways of removing the legal obstacles uh, facing citizens and companies uh, seeking to exercise their right to freedom of movement uh, and also to restore uh, trust and confidence. Uh, let me just give you a practical example of this. In the Legal Affairs Committee, in Jury, there is a whole debate underway on easy and automatic uh, recognition of uh, civil status documents. And this, I think, is um, very important because those uh, sometimes uh, uh, authenticated, certified documents of that kind might seem to be not a top priority. However, for individual citizens, uh, they want to be able to have access to uh, authenticated civil um, status documents. It's something which is very important for individuals. Um, and indeed, diplomas and qualifications uh, are important for university access um, in various, um, at various times of people's lives. Uh, they need civil status documents. 
it's important for individuals and for their uh, families so that they can have access, they can exercise their rights wherever they are in Europe. So this is one of those points uh, which has been uh, reflected in a number of amendments which we uh, welcome. There is also a general de de desire uh, to improve the legal culture. In other words, um, the general knowledge on the part of um, various practitioners within the judiciary. And that's important for the, if the uh, fundamental rights are going to be a reality, if subsidiarity can be uh, implemented for the judiciary to be independent. Uh, this is important to flesh out all of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, so rule of law, uh, all of those um, information on the part of the various bodies within the judi judiciary is very important. Knowledge of other legal systems um, between member states is again very important. Mutual trust and confidence in the quality of justice uh, within individual member states. This is again uh, moving up the, this is a real uh, issue now. Other amendments seek to ensure that the member states um, have got legal systems which are fully functional. And on that basis, we need mutual recognition of decision, of legal decisions that must also be based on a, um, shared trust. And that requires, that entails um, a familiarity with the legal systems which apply in other countries. So there are amendments on that subject as well. Another series of amendments has to do with uh, procedural rights, in, uh, particularly in criminal proceedings. Um, this is um, free legal aid, free legal assistance, particularly for vulnerable groups, uh, because there are currently obstacles at council level. Uh, there's a need also for the, an improvement in the arrest wa European arrest warrant. Uh, from our perch in the Legal Affairs Committee, we would insist on this so that uh, due account is taken of the procedural rights uh, because sometimes I think that we are too, um, we tend too much to look at these uh, rights in purely theoretical or legal terms. Uh, but there is a nitty gritty side to that and how they work in practice. There is another series um, on the horizontal uh, aspects of how the uh, European legal order works. Now, having joint meetings of the committee. Um, surrounding the Stockholm programme, uh, they're very important. This is an area which is becoming ever, is looming ever larger. It's just as important as coming up with um, agreed standards across Europe. They've got to be uh, respected, they've got to be implemented uh, so that the, the, their efficacy can be um, counted on. That's essential if the legal principles uh, are going to read across into uh, hard fact. We need to create conditions, and there are amendments on this, uh, whereby there is prop, uh, closer coordination um, and cooperation between the uh, Commission, the Member States and the different agencies, so that the information can be disseminated um, throughout the Member States. So information pathways have got to be there and they've got to be open if we are to have traceability and ex post monitoring of an objective nature. Uh, we need to know what the legislation is, uh, what the detailed uh, provisions are within member states. There are amendments calling on the Commission to give greater emphasis uh, to the monitoring side of implementation. There has been a problem on a deficit on the implementation uh, side. Uh, there have been uh, constraints and limitations of a um, practical nature. And this, I think, is becoming ever clearer that there is a, if there is a deficit, then it is on the implementation front. Last week in the Legal Affairs Committee, we were looking at a document which is a study by the policy department called Tools for Ensuring Implementation and Application of European Law and Evaluation of Their Effectiveness.
which I would recommend. Now, this is an intuition, if you like, and this really emanated from the joint meeting of committees, and that's now been corroborated by the appearance of that study from the policy department on implementation, and it makes very uh, alarming reading, very worrying reading. So I would um, recommend that one for anyone interested here, and it's clearly something which is, as I say, looming ever larger. Another point which is um, coming on uh, loud and clear is the, a number of directives on the environment where there's been a problem of transposition. Some 91% of them have not been properly transposed. And the internal market, citizens' rights, fundamental rights, there the transposition deficit has been is running at 73 percent and you may ask yourself why churn out these directives if they're not going to be transposed uh, this is if you like an intrinsic and inherent contradiction in the work that uh, this, the besetting sin of legislation uh, because we're not just here to make law uh, we're not just here as co-legislators we must also keep up the pressure to make sure that um, the laws we put on the statute book actually um, hold sway in the member states and, and are properly transposed and, uh, and implemented. If you look, for example, at the number of infringement proceedings, they are on the increase. And that is how the European Union cracks down on member states which are not um, behaving, as it were, not, not virtuous. Uh, we have Article 260 in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which talks about transposition of the directives. And uh, there, the whole question is timeliness. It's not transposition as such, but it's got to be um, transposed in a timely manner. And uh, we've seen that there is a big deficit on that front over recent history. The question arrives. The problem arises as to um, removing the barriers to timely transposition. Some of the problems, I think, uh, stem from the vagueness um, of the terms in which directives are transposed. I think part of the difficulty is that the procedures and the judicial structure um, is woolly and uh, this uh, causes uh, delays and uh, a kind of uh, vagueness which is the, the source of, of much concern. So there are big problems on the implementation front and transposition. Um, then further down the road, of course, you will have problems of enforcement. And I would simply uh, draw attention to this. This is a very enlightening study by the policy department. It's one which I really would um, commend to you, and it's uh, does credit to those who uh, produced that. They also underline, quite rightly, this question of um, the lack of um, virtue on the transposition front, um, so that we know where the offenders are, who the offenders are in the member states. This is something which may have been an object of um, academic curiosity, uh, but this study, I think, tells us that uh, we've got to get to grips with those difficulties. Uh, there clearly are obstacles, hurdles to transposition, and this puts a big question mark over um, our legislative processes. The member states clearly have an important role to play, with, particularly with directives, and we must ask whether the remedies um, are really um, uh, taken seriously by the member states. Are there, are there inherent weaknesses in the, the format of legislation? Are the member states fully cognizant of the need for them uh, to transpose EU legislation in a timely manner? Um, are they, do they lose sleep over the, uh, their job of transposition? I think that perhaps uh, there's room for uh, improvement there, and I think that it's right for us to indicate uh, what might be the avenues to pursue. Uh, we've had some positive responses 
from the Commission because they now have the scoreboard, which means that it's possible to, um, to benchmark the judiciary and the, the judicial systems and how they are faring, as it were. I have an amendment down myself which draws attention to the um, quality of legal systems, um, saying that this can um, have an important role in uh, restoring confidence and trust on the part of citizens in things European. Um, timeliness on the part of uh, the executive arm is an important part of uh, European citizenship and uh, also provides um, a proper framework for business as well. Judicial training is another area. Judicial training is important for all legal practitioners. Um, as part of that uh, space of um, freedom and justice, and uh, we uh, draw attention to the need to have proper training of lawyers. Uh, the relationship between the citizens and the justice system is, of course, it goes via, is mediated uh, by lawyers. And uh, the lawyer is someone who the um, citizen has got to have confidence in, in their abilities and, that's, and their aptitude, their skills and qualifications, hence the need for uh, training. I think that technology has not kept up there. Access to the sources of um, knowledge about the legal um, jurisprudence and uh, case law and so on um, could also be improved and that's why we've got amendments down. I believe that uh, we've got to make these course corrections. Um, we've already had, we are now looking at the uh, mid-term review of the Stockholm programme and I think this is a good time for us to see how we've been uh, getting on. Thank you very much uh, Mr Bellinka. Now the Chairman of the uh, AFCO committee, Mr Cassini. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I'll keep this uh, brief and uh, just outline a couple of the um, big things from the AFCO perspective. Of course, we're interested um, in the constitutional law dimension, which helps us to narrow things down somewhat. Our second uh, perspective is that I'll be making general comments uh, about the amendments which have been submitted. Uh, there are a large number of them. I'll not go through them uh, individually. I'll try to give you an, over an overview. Some of them are purely formal in order to improve uh, the, the wording of certain concepts. Some of them are more substantive. For example, those on the human rights, on the powers of the parliament, uh, the national institutions, and there are big chapters there which are of direct concern to the AFCO committee. Now, on all of these things, uh, we have adopted resolutions over time. Most of these have gone through the plenary itself, so we don't need to rehearse all of uh, the track record. Now, when it comes to Parliament's prerogatives, um, I will have to argue against all of the amendments which um, in, in, encroach on the Parliament's prerogatives. I'm in favour of other amendments which in their various ways seek to um, suggest ways in which the democratic um, and legislative powers of Parliament can be beefed up. I think we've got to keep on up the reflection process on the need for transparency um, when we have these trialogues. That is an important part of uh, co-decision, where there is provision for a first, second and third um, bite of the cherry. And I think transparency is important there. I think that there's room for a commission initiative whereby they would accept Parliament's requests more often so that the Parliament does have genuine powers of initiative. There are other amendments which I think deserve attention and uh, careful thought. They talk about multi-annual programs. Uh, do we have the requisite legal basis 
um, to make sure that the Parliament is properly in the loop there. On human rights, there's a range of uh, amendments which we could agree with. In AFCO, we are very concerned um, about the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. That's something where we've got to keep up the, the efforts. Uh, this is a dictate which uh, flows directly from the Lisbon Treaty. Some problems have been resolved, some are still outstanding. Um, the amendments which uh, seek to close the uh, remaining gaps in that work are very welcome. One little comment on human rights. If you look at the enumeration, the list of cases of discrimination, any case of discrimination against uh, anyone is a breach of human rights. And it's important that if you have a, a the legal eagles are very good at drawing up lists of different kinds, establishing a kind of uh, list of um, forms of, of discrimination. And I think that we can solve the problem of having a, a non-exhaustive list by saying that in general, a bl uh, in a blanket way, that all forms of discrimination are to be um, proscribed. I think that there is also a need for the subsidiarity test, not just for national legislation, but for sub-national legislation, in other words, at the regional level, by the regional assemblies. This, I think, may require a change to the treaties, um, because then the European Parliament would have a direct pathway to regional parliaments. And that's something which we need to give thought to. There are amendments to do also to do with uh, the electoral law. In this area, we've not been uh, successful in uh, complying with the injunction from the Lisbon Treaty, where we were supposed to have a single Euro electoral law. Um, various um, forms of bureaucratic tinkering have taken place, uh, but it's not a single uh, system of European law for European uh, Parliament elections. Um, let's not forget this is a treaty dictate. It's um, an obligation under the treaty, and there is a degree. This is one of the reasons why there is such um, scepticism around the European uh, Union. Uh, there's a need for a single system to increase the degree of transparency, uh, the role of parties, for example. We need some kind of benchmark, whether that's mathematical or or something else, because at present we have uh, endless discussions about the allocation of seats within the, the Parliament as between the countries. Uh, that was the case with when uh, Croatia joined. Uh, there are amendments as to do with uh, regional, the regional level, other amendments on direct elections uh, to the top jobs in uh, the European Union. For example, the President of the Commission. And I think that uh, there's a need to look at the various ramifications of that, in the, the powers and the role, uh, the portfolios, the, the function of individual commissioners within the uh, Commission. Um, we are obviously in favour of many of the amendments which have been put um, by AFCO in overcoming bureaucratic obstacles to active participation in um, European elections, in particular with regard to European nationals who are living in a country other than their country of origin, in other words, who are resident in a country other than their country uh, of their nationality. Um, a range of amendments are done also on ECI's, the European Citizens Initiative. That was one of the big adver uh, new things, the big innovations with Lisbon. And I think that they deserve uh, much more uh, careful examination. There is clearly a financial difficulty if citizens are to partake in this form of direct uh, democracy. They need uh, some form of financial support, and that has got to be meet the standard of transparency as well. Uh, there are amendments saying that the system for gathering signatures electronically is um, very expensive and complicated for the ECIs and that something has to be done to facilitate uh, access to make that more of a, um, a, 
a more accessible f possibility. Um, for example, on the question of um, checking on the bona fides of uh, signatures, uh, there again there's plenty of room and it's a balancing act between making streamlining it and making sure that the necessary safeguards are built into the system. So there are amendments on that subject. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps not this parliament, but the next parliament will be able to turn its attention to the effectiveness of uh, ECIs uh, to see what happens to them throughout the process. And one or two amendments, I think, do anticipate uh, and second guess what might happen um, in the next parliament. Something else, uh, which is a, the, well, those are the main points which are of con direct concern to AFCO. If I could be just allowed to make a, a general uh, statement of uh, support for a range of fields which are of interest to us, but where we're not uh, directly competent. Um, immigration asylum, and asylum are areas where a number of amendments have been submitted. Um, some of them say that there's need, this need to, to reconcile, to strike a balance uh, between welcome on the one hand and security on the other. This is important not just uh, from an Italian perspective or as a, as a citizen from the south of uh, Europe where there are daily uh, problems on the immigration front. I think it's really only logical uh, if we're going to be uh, consistent in the principles which we um, assert about integration. Uh, there are countries, Greece, uh, Cyprus, Malta, the south, uh, which, uh, where, which, are, which have got external borders, but that does not in any way detract from, um, from their status as uh, fully signed up uh, Europeans. It's important, therefore, that we cover the security and the welcome sides of that equation. I very much agree with things which have been uh, put down uh, on the justice front, particularly the ground covered by Mr. Berlinguer a moment ago, um, particularly the need for training uh, for the legal um, professions, the legal practitioners, and also um, the need for work in, uh, on the procedural uh, front as well. Um, and that, I think, is all for me for the time being. La ringraziamo, Presidente Casini. Thank you, Chairman Cassini. Now, if I may, as rapporteur uh, from the LIBE committee, I would like to make a few brief comments on my own uh, position uh, with respect to the amendments uh, that are presented in these subjects dealt with uh, by the uh, Civil Liberties Committee. First of all, could I refer to the uh, horizontal issues? Those dealing with uh, issues of, of a horizontal nature, which many amendments refer to, and as you know, there are more than 300 amendments. First of all, I'd like to ask for support so that the report in front of us uh, is uh, concise with clear messages and that it concentrates uh, primarily on the so-called implementation of the Stockholm um, program. I uh, don't really see the need to discuss issues uh, for which the Parliament has already got a position. For example, the entry into Schengen of uh, Romania and Bulgaria. This is something the Parliament has already dealt with. Secondly, I think quite a few amendments are identical. So we're going to be working on uh, sorting out compromises amongst all of those amendments. And some of those are um, more pertinent than others, obviously. And there's also including the external uh, aspect of uh, the uh, j justice and uh, legal area. There are other specific aspects and what I think is important in priority when we look at the compromises is to m maintain our focus on so-called policy areas. There's a discussion on the electoral system. I don't know whether this is the appropriate report to deal with that uh, or not. 
I'll discuss that uh, with my colleagues, uh, whether we should include a, a reference to that or not in the final version. But uh, from the amendments, uh, it would appear that we're convinced that the Council and the Commission need to act once and for all on what the new institutional scenario means under the Lisbon Treaty, since, as we all know, accents uh, as never before the role of the parliament in particular regarding uh, security justice uh, uh, issues um, one of my amendments uh, number four i want to make a specific reference uh, to this significant dimension uh, th that is the defense of uh, human rights uh, uh, and uh, its complementary nature with the level of protection in the member states uh, so that we reach uh, the highest level of effective protection uh, possible, which is exactly what uh, the uh, Charter on Fundamental Rights uh, states in its Article 53. There are various colleagues who've uh, submitted amendments uh, so that uh, what is uh, set out in the Stockholm Programme is applicable to uh, all citizens in an inclusive manner, not just uh, citizens of the member states, but also those who are residents and immigrants uh, uh, in terms of justice and uh, legal security. Uh, this affects everyone, notwithstanding their status uh, inside the European Union. Now, this would appear to be a key point that the time of major intergovernmental programs uh, such as the temporary and the Hague uh, program and basically the Stockholm program as well which was adopted in by the Swedish presidency in the second half of 2009 that uh, the times have changed uh, after the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty we have a, a long list of legal basis which allows the Commission to use its uh, right of initiative in those areas covered by the current Stockholm program. A significant uh, aspect of this new uh, configuration uh, is the relationships with the national parliaments, uh, which we have been working on throughout uh, the current uh, mandate. I think we need to reinforce our vocation to make sure that the uh, practice of this principle of subsidiarity is maintained uh, in conjunction with the role of the national parliaments. And the representatives of uh, our citizens uh, should meet at the national as well as uh, European level, and they have different uh, uh, tasks, uh, but there should be an ongoing uh, cycle of dialogue at which the Council should participate as well as co-legislator as well as the uh, agencies uh, in the, uh, f covering the various areas. And then there's the so-called Copenhagen dilemma. Uh, we discussed this uh, several times. Here, the justice scoreboard needs to uh, cover quality indicators and the levels uh, of the respect for fundamental human rights in member states of the EU. Uh, we'll, we're going to be working on a series of compromises on this. And then uh, the, the fight against uh, radicalism, exclusion, uh, xenophobia, etc. All of those uh, have been the subject of uh, some amendments from the Libe Committee as well. Obviously, the new program will have to um, make this a battle horse uh, in the fight against uh, stigmatization, uh, defense of difference, and a fight against prejudice and intolerance. Uh, we discussed uh, this explicitly at a hearing in the Libe Committee last week. And in my own amendments, there's a specific uh, reference to data protection. That's uh, Amendment 102, where there's an appeal for the uh, data protection package to move forward. We're in the final uh, line before the elections, and we shouldn't fail in this uh, uh, task because it's a very visible uh, aspect to the citizens. And I think if it's a very serious uh, aspect uh, for the citizens. And we also need to work on uh, procedural uh, rights. Uh, w we have uh, worked on this as well, in particular the uh, European uh, criminal rights, which has uh, technical uh, details that have to be debated. 
The same uh, goes for the, the Treaty on uh, Home Security. At the last meeting in Strasbourg, I put an oral question to the Commission, which gave rise to a debate and a resolution. And so the contents of that resolution also needs to be reflected in the final version of the report on the Stockholm Programme. And then uh, my amendment to 254 uh, is asking for an extension uh, of uh, the external borders. Uh, we talked about the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, tribunals. Uh, uh, and obviously we need to have a look at the external dimension of asylum, the question of solidarity, the solidarity clause, which we've heard mentioned uh, many times over this parliament on the impact of common asylum and refugee policies uh, on the management of the external borders of the EU. So obviously I agree with the comments uh, made by my colleagues uh, about the importance of uh, a legal culture. I can't uh, stress uh, enough uh, how many times we have uh, insisted on the importance uh, of the area of uh, freedom and justice uh, that should be uh, extended. Uh, I mean, we're all European uh, legal experts. We've all uh, we're all legal practitioners. Uh, And we need to work on the practical implementation of these grand declarations uh, uh, through legal practitioners who are truly familiar with a legal a European legal culture, but that's not going to uh, grow on trees. Uh, it's got to be actively promoted through the work of the uh, European institutions with specific programs of financing so that uh, professionals in European law are really aware that without their commitment uh, and efforts that we're not going to really achieve our European uh, area for justice and freedom. So uh, I'm grateful for uh, the participation of a uh, representative from DG Justice, uh, Mr. Ego Weissenfeld, and we also have uh, the presidency here if they have anything to add. But first of all, uh, perhaps we could uh, listen to the uh, members who have asked for the floor, uh, Mr. Guerrero Salon. Sí, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the work done by our three rapporteurs. Everyone knows how complicated it is uh, to work from uh, slightly different angles on a common report. I submitted a fair number of amendments. Uh, obviously, the AFCO committee, uh, amongst the three committees, is the committee uh, which has submitted the fewest amendments. Uh, that's fairly logical. And Mr. Cassini, of the, uh, as chairman of the committee, uh, ran through the vast majority of them. So I can be very brief and just stress that despite uh, the fact that uh, uh, this is coming from a member of the AFCO committee. The approach is not necessarily an institutional approach, but rather this comes from the citizen's perspective. When we submitted an amendment on access to documents, we're reinforcing not just transparency as an institutional behavior, but rather the European citizen's right to have access to information uh, through which uh, decisions are taken at the EU. We want to reinforce the role of the Commission in leading the defense of human rights contained in the treaty. In fact, what we're asking for is the protection of our citizens uh, through the Commission's intervention. Or when we try to say that we need to have a uh, reference to the law on uh, foundations and parties. Uh, we are defending our citizens' rights to act uh, politically through parties and uh, foundations. And finally, there are a lot of references to the electoral system, uh, as uh, both Mr. Cassini and uh, Mr. Lopez Aguilar uh, mentioned. Well, we had a, 
lengthy and uh, failed history, uh, not just within AFCO, but uh, within the parliament as a whole, about uh, the reform of the electoral system. But I don't think it's a bad thing for us to ask, nonetheless, as I'm doing in an, amen an amendment, uh, to uh, work towards our own autonomous electoral system, and uh, which is uh, progressively hom homogenous. Uh, I don't want to use the word uniform because that's a, a blocking uh, point, but rather uh, our own system, which regulates the European institutions, so autonomous, in the sense that it's detached from the electoral systems of the member states, which are those who block the changes uh, within the European area uh, and homogenous, and that it, is, it means it's not necessarily exactly the same everywhere, but that it has common elements which allows the citizens to have a political awareness that whereby when they vote in the European elections, they're voting in something unique and not just an extension of their regional or national elections. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Ba Mr. Luhan. Thank you. În primul rând, domnule președinte, estimați raportori, vreau să vă mulțumesc pentru raportul extrem de elaborat și extrem de complex. Thank you. This is a very uh, extensive and complex report which uh, wants to uh, cover a large number of subjects, but a lot of them are very sensitive and delicate for all European citizens especially for those which are still going through the process of adopting fundamental rights legislation. I'd like to make a couple of points. A lot has been said, and there's a lot still to say about this because it's so complicated. However, I do think we should focus particularly in this committee and indeed in the Parliament and the other institutions and that is uh, electronic voting. This is uh, a citizen's right, and I think we can say that there's a democratic shortfall here because in some member states, uh, citizens are not able to uh, vote electronically. This is something that I feel should be resolved immediately. The European Union is uh, in a position to take an initiative here uh, we're saying uh, what uh, kinds of uh, electoral systems are we going to have governed by member states. We can put forward proposals to the Commission, uh, uh, launch a debate and engage the member states on this. A second problem I want to raise is uh, that of uh, justice itself. I think there are different definitions of justice in different countries. If we're talking about human rights, human rights uh, defense and violations, uh, there we are talking about justice. And uh, justice uh, has the role of uh, overseeing uh, anything that is not uh, being done correctly, that is uh, being done wrongly. Uh, in many fields, on uh, cooperation, on uh, economic matters as well. Uh, justice is inadequate. It's good to be able to uh, uh, amend things and introduce legal systems whereby there can be penalties and sanctions against those who uh, commit crimes or irregularities. But uh, in many legal systems, such as in my country, there is not enough emphasis on uh, recovering uh, economic losses. In the case of uh, tax evasion, for example, there are no penalties. There are no fines designed to recover losses as a result of this evasion. The justice system prefers to uh, hand down prison sentences for this kind of crime. So I think we should have a debate on this and see whether we couldn't uh, somehow rework the concept of justice here so that member states uh, can um, recover losses in the case of uh, tax or financial irregularities. And last, uh, a final point, 
that's of particular interest to my country. Is this, and there's a lot of amendments on it, uh, the subject of uh, Schengen, fundamental laws, uh, the right uh, of uh, the freedoms of movement and trade are fundamental pillars in the EU. And it seems that at the moment, citizens of some uh, countries are second class citizens in the context of Schengen. Uh, or that their rights are somehow limited for certain reasons. So joining the Schengen system doesn't uh, involve any particular economic advantage. However, being part of it is a symbol of uh, trust and equal treatment for all European citizens. Thank you. We don't want to be in trouble with the interpreters. Peace mind the time because we've got at least to go. And the scheduled time is until 12.30. Maybe we could have some additional minutes to spare, but please mind the timing. Señora Romero López. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to uh, say how important this uh, intermediate assessment is. Uh, and, uh, it would have been nice uh, to uh, do this before the final evaluation because, in fact, this is only the first period. Uh, and, in fact, uh, this is of great importance to all three committees present uh, because after the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, the Charter on Fundamental Rights uh, is uh, the very reflection of uh, the Constitutional Affairs Committee is work. Uh, that's why they're fundamental rights. I would uh, stress the imbalances that the, the thematic department has raised uh, regarding this uh, midterm review uh, because these imbalances are still there. When we talk about the Treaty of uh, Home Security for 2014, we're not talking about a strategy for consolidating and defense uh, fundamental, of fundamental rights. This strategy for the uh, defense of uh, fundamental rights is uh, just as important as uh, the uh, work on the internal security strategy. Uh, that's why we see imbalances. Unfortunately, maybe this is due to the budget uh, problems, uh, because normally uh, the budgets are under threat. Uh, I'm pleased, though, that we are having this debate on the midterm review. Mrs. Lichtenberger. Yeah, herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much. Uh, can I point out once again how important integration? Or, or is uh, for the instrument uh, on um, monitoring of uh, the implementation of existing rights in the member states. Our point is that when it looks at uh, freedom of uh, access, there are extremely different uh, interpretations which lead to uh, changes in the implementation. And thus, uh, we have uh, legal certainty being undermined. And a second point that's extremely important to me is uh, ensuring that a procedural law is ensured in cross-border uh, criminal law cases. Now, we've discussed, on, discussed the need to, uh, for translation and uh, other provision of rights. These are things that require uh, a strengthening of our uh, uh, of the procedural side of it, better training and so on. But we have to set down the foundations here that will make that possible so that uh, we can uh, answer what we claim for our citizens. There has to be uh, a possibility for people to set up cross-border companies and to operate in a cross-border fashion so that when there's problems, there's a legal system they can rely on, that they can have access to and uh, which uh, answers and ensures their, and guarantees their rights cross, in a cross-border fashion. Mr. Bronze. Uh, thank you. Uh, I found the words of Mr. Uh, Billingway uh, about failure of member states to transpose directives in a timely manner quite revealing. The English translation uh, was, we must crack down on misbehavior by member states and we must know who the offenders are. 
I'm sure that citizens of member states will find that language uh, alarming when it's brought to their attention. Um, it seems to me that member states are spoken of as though they were naughty children rather than sovereign bodies. I was interested uh, from uh, Mr Cassini to hear that all discrimination should be prohibited and not simply a list. I wonder if that would include discrimination on the grounds of political affiliation or opinion, because such discrimination in the United Kingdom is absolutely endemic and expressly supported by the whole of the political class. Mr Cassini referred to Citizens' Initiative as a form of direct democracy. Now, they do have some superficial similarities, but of course there are fundamental differences. Citizens' initiatives involve only those who sign uh, or refuse a request to sign, and not, of course, the vast majority of people. Furthermore, the result of a citizens' initiative uh, isn't a decision by the peoples of member states as a whole. It's a plea for action by the Commission, which can, of course, be refused. In fact, citizens' initiatives have got much more in common with petitions than they do with decisions by direct democracy. I'm not sure that petitioners should be supported financially, especially as there be a distinction between those approved of and those disapproved of. And there's also something, I think, inherently improper by definition for petitioners to be in the pocket of the petitioned. Uh, there was a reference to the Fa Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, as we've discussed in AFCO, we now know from the case of NS against the United Kingdom that Protocol 30 does not constitute an opt-out. What we don't know is what it does constitute, and I think that needs to be explored more thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you. Señora Jiménez Becerril. Sí, muchas gracias, señor presidente. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Well, today we voted in the Foreign Affairs Committee on the opinion uh, that uh, I was a shadow rapporteur on, and I want to say that this opinion was uh, uh, approved, and uh, the majority of the amendments uh, were designed to include uh, immigrants' rights, which Mr. Cassini talked about, the m and the mo most of the uh, amendments were along those lines. But I would say that we weren't able to reach many compromises. There was only one compromise. There were a lot of amendments on terrorism victims, uh, victims of trafficking, uh, uh, and I just want to say that I do hope that you carry on uh, working and bearing uh, these amendments in mind on the support, protection, and rights of uh, victims of crime. And just one question about the electoral law. Mr. Cassini talked about regional and national laws, Mr. Guerrero as well, but given that there are many amendments on the European electoral law, since we are approaching the European elections, I'd like to know what your opinion is on that. Are you going to leave that out, or do you think it should be covered as well? Thank you. Back to our rapporteurs here. Maybe, I understand the Council is not willing to make any point at this point of the discussion at this stage. Maybe the Commission would like to make something shortly, to make some statement or something, some comment, please, real shortly, so that we do not run out of interpreters. Could you? Yes, thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, and um, at this stage of the discussion, the Commission would like to emphasize only just once more, as there have been some amendments to um, paragraph or proposed amendments to paragraph 5 of the text as it stands right now, we would like to reiterate what you already said, uh, Mr. Lopez Aguilar, that um, all this exercise should be seen in the new post-Lisbon institutional context, and um, that we should all be aware of the fact that um, the justice policy as well as the Home Affairs Policy is now a mature and normal policy of the EU and um, that the Commission will plead to avoid um, shopping lists for the future and to focus rather on strategies than on very, very detailed um, annual programs that could limit the powers of the incoming um, Parliament or um, also of the Commission. And now my colleague from Thank you. Any further point from any other Commission's representative? Please, shortly. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Just to emphasize, the report calls on the Commission to create and to study the idea of European border guards. We have noted some amendments that would like to delete these points. I would like to reiterate that the Commission is working on a feasibility study, as we committed to during the negotiation of the Frontex regulation that should be available in the course of the next year. Also, let me point out that the detailed statistics on anti-trafficking have been made available uh, just this year, so there is certainly a need uh, to do even more, but we have already a very good ground on this uh, collection of statistics as well as on interagency cooperation. And finally, the Commission that will present a communication on the future challenges uh, and measures in the area of uh, justice and home affairs in the course of next year is also very much reflecting on the issue of evaluation and we share the concerns expressed by Rapporteur Berlinguer on the importance of evaluation even more in the future in these areas. Thank you. Of course, all of us here, three rapporteurs, have taken note of every comment that has been made, every point, but maybe some specific question was made to Honorable Casini as to the electoral system. Would you like to make some short comment just to conclude, please? Brevemente per di Thank you, Chairman. Just very briefly, if I might, just to say that I agree very much with Mr. Gerever Salom, who says that you cannot have a, a single system for um, elections this time round, but um, perhaps our successors will do that. But I think that to Mr. Gerever, can I say that we can suggest ways in which that might be organized, um, which may be of benefit and um, uh, use to our successors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being so, so quick. Mr. Bellinguer, nothing to add. No? Thank you very much. Let me just announce, let me just announce that uh, the uh, scheduled date that was firstly envisaged for the vote, 21st of October, is not going to be not going to be possible anymore, so we are currently trying to find another date for the, for the, for the uh, vote on the amendments. We thank you all, and we will be resuming our work by 3 p.m. with the uh, Lib Inquiry. Thank you all.